Carl is no longer in a fat bunker. What's going on? Yeah, the concrete fat bunker is no more. So should we, should we explain why I'm like suddenly recording in what every YouTuber records from, which is a nondescript white room with their bed in the background? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so anyone who's followed our content, like, you know, you'll know that Fact Fiend started in a kitchen and then it went to an office and the pandemic happened and the production moved to my house, then briefly back to the office and then back to my house again. I have moved out of that house, which colloquially became known as the Concrete Fact Bunker, because I am in the process of purchasing a place, i.e. this place. Mm-hmm. And one of the decisions that I made when I was getting set up, so I spent the last, last few days getting set up, is I don't want, like my previous place, 50% of the floor space to be dedicated to my work. And Lucas, you you went to my previous place, the Concrete Fat Bunker. Mm-hmm. How much square footage of that flat was dedicated to this is Fat Fiend stuff, this is Wiki Weekend stuff, this is just my workspace? Yeah, essentially you'd taken all of what was probably meant to be like the living space, taken the living room, Put, crammed it all into your bedroom yep. and then made the living space just your office entirely because yep. at one point we were recording with like four up to four people in that space it needed quite a lot of room it didn't yeah. really need that much room but like, you know to get in that air of to be comfortable with four of us there i guess yeah like yeah and like for specific recordings we used a green screen for a lot of it you need at least six but behind you, the green screen, you need to be sitting there six foot to the camera, which mm-hmm. is like, you know, basically that would be this entire room, which is my bedroom. And I just made the decision of, I want just a small part of my house to be my office space. And I want the mm-hmm. rest to be my living space. It's a smart move. Yes. Yeah. It's a smart move. If you want to do this thing called enjoy your mental health. <laughs> Carl, God, how dare you meant like just actually describe your mental health on camera mm-hmm. like so that's why i'm suddenly in a very different looking look but i think it just it looks clean it's clean it's yeah. crisp we're in the process of buying better lighting there's gonna be some new lighting i need, still need to get my youtuber gamer shelf delivered which is gonna have all my mm-hmm. knickknacks and stuff on it i want to get some nice colorful up lighting and you can see that like behind. yeah any, anyone watching you could see that carl before we started recording was like how does it look if i put like this big studio light on it was like well it looks like there's just heaven behind you it the wall was blown out to get the setup that we used to have i needed four of those placed at least 10 foot apart Mm -hmm. all the way around my apartment and it's like i don't want to do that because i want to live here (laughs) it's also very unwelcoming for like you know if you want to have a social life and that's the thing a lot of like content creators talk about isn't it yeah just my entire house my living space is just work it's just my streaming setup mm-hmm. and i don't i didn't want that so i made the executive decision of like, i'm going to make it just like anyone else with an office it's gonna be a little yeah. corner of a house where i can work and i can forget about it i'm not going to be tripping over lights and wires and green screens all of which i still have but it's now in storage and it's one of those weird things isn't it where it it's okay when me or another close friend comes around that already understood your situation but it's someone that wasn't as familiar with what you do for a living game round. It's like, why is your entire flat just full of lights and cameras? What's going on? Well, the worst bit is I didn't have a dedicated place to like watch TV, for example. Mm-hmm. Like there was nowhere to watch TV because obviously I just oh I don't watch TV. I just have like my laptop on all the time. I had a date where we went over a film night, and it's like there's nowhere in my place to watch a film. There's nowhere to sit down. I don't have a sofa. <laughs> I moved it to make room for recording. Mm-hmm. And that date did not go very well. <laughs> Fair, yeah. Because yeah. I, don't, I just didn't take that into consideration. Now I have. Now my space is more evenly divided for work, life, and leisure. Now instead, Carl, what's going to happen? Is he going to bring someone around for a date and they're going to be like, why do you have a camera pointed at your bed? No, it's a camera pointed at my work space. No, it's no, fine. No, no it's fine because <laughs> I've got like this. I can go at the end of it. Of course, yeah. Like, God, I do not know the the like levels of bravery that people have when they leave their camera plugged in potentially powered on pointed at them and don't cover it up like god it's just i always have like a the little cover on top of my camera and then i put my monitor on my monitor arm like back up to block it as well i have like double blockage yep 
I mean, you won't plug your microphone. Mm-hmm. Can't trust that shit. You can't. But yeah, that's why like the recording space has changed. But hopefully, the quality should not differ. The audio quality and video quality should remain the same. If anything, it should get better. You know, I'm closer to the camera so you can see like that I've aged. Also, it adds <laughs> a bit more visual symmetry. Because previously, I was recording like I'm like doing an interview for The Apprentice, and you're recording like a streamer. Now at least yeah. we have some visual um, uh, symmetry there. Because like I've always had a setup like this where my desk is against the wall and my camera is attached to my desk, which meant that for streaming, it's great. This is what the setup was kind of initially built for, was with streaming in mind, so I'm only a small portion, but for these kind of videos, it means I was way more zoomed in than you were, but now we we're both in the land of Zoom. Yeah, also as well, um, uh, just, it's a, a good just uh, encapsulation of our personalities. Of mine is just nothing. <laughs> There's nothing visible. It's just what my like my bedroom space is always like. It is always there is nothing out. Um, Everything is crisp, and then yours is just a mess of not like a mess. Which it's is like, not messy, but it's a mess of like here's all my like gamer junk that I've hoarded over the years. Wait, who was the uh? The the woman that went viral for a while on like Netflix of like does it bring you joy? Marie Kondo. That's it. It's like it looks like Carl's Marie Kondo is flat, whereas I'm just like fuck it. We we keep everything, including like my N sixty four games from when I was three years old. See, I have all that, but do you know where it is? It's in a box that is very neatly organized underneath my bed. Mm hmm. You'll notice my bed. I have the nice long sheet. I've got really nice sheets. I have really nice sheets. That's the thing. I, I remember there was an interview with, um, oh, what's he now? Um, Anthony Mackie, where he talks about oh, yeah. how he has one of those like old people osteo like profess- osteoporosis beds where they go, mm, yeah, and he sleeps naked with cotton Egyptian cotton sheets. And I asked him why. He went, because I've got nice sheets. I want to feel them. Also, if you know what sort of a ball ache it is to sit up and watch TV, yeah. not in my electronic bed. And he said the wife was really upset about it at first until the first night where, you know, we'd, we'd done the, the husband and wife deed and then I'd press the button and like, and we got a cup of coffee. And went, That's living. Honestly, like, I don't know why those beds are only sold as, you know, assistance beds. I guess maybe because there's not many in production or something, but like... And they're very expensive. They are super expensive, but the idea of just yeah pressing a button and the bed sitting up for me so that I don't have to like do that awkward thing where you crushed against the headrest and like just trying like, to know, sit up. Think like, about in the morning when you sat there with your morning coffee and you have got to do that thing where you like put your pillows against the wall and then you slide mm-hmm. down. So instead, it's just because you ready. don't want to be sat all the way up completely vertical in a bed, but you do want to be leaned a little bit forward. Like say you're mm-hmm. like at night, just watching yeah. like you know some shit on YouTube or whatever. You got your laptop up. Or you're just scrolling on your phone. Mm-hmm. That's why um, I I did the great thing of getting one of those like arms to attach to your headrest, and it's like my switch. I can just like put on the arm and bring the arm in front of my face, thing and then just like play a game, just sitting in bed, lying all the way down. All I think when I hear that is that like shit post on 4chan of a guy who's like get on my level and he has that set up. Mm-hmm. And the first response is just the people from Wally. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. That's the thing is, I like the idea of that setup. How often do I use it? Not very often at all. But it's nice as an option. Get the Sakurai setup where he has an iPad directly above his head. That he, and he has like two things, and he scrolls through manga before he goes to sleep. Oh, nice. Yeah. But either way, that, that's 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 the difference in the setup. That is indeed and. Um... For anyone that is unfamiliar with what we do here, Carl, this is, of course, the Wiki Weekdays podcast, where, believe it or not, we do get to a wiki at some point. We do, Despite, yes. you know, an intro of just us chatting. But it's the Wiki Weekdays podcast where we wind up a wiki, we take a deep dive, and we keep swimming until we find something fun to talk about. I'm your host for this week's episode, Lucas Holland, and as always, it brings me a great pleasure to introduce my lovely co-host for the week, Carl Smallwood. And yeah, of course, every episode of the Wiki Week Days podcast, we ask people to vote for the previous week's podcast of which wiki won this week. 
where you know you just vote for whichever wiki you thought brought the best discussion, not whichever subject was your favourite. And which wiki won last week? It was Roller Coaster Tycoon against Daft Punk last week. And can you brought... guess who won? It's going to be Roller Coaster Tycoon, right? Because so many people have nostalgia it... for Roller Coaster Tycoon. It was Roller Coaster Tycoon, but it won by one single vote. There you go. Your vote matters, folks. Exactly, yes. And just, I liked both discussions last week. They went in both very different ways. And I assume that's going to happen this week because we are, we did have a discussion this week of what we are going to talk about. I oh, presume yeah, this week's like, going to yeah. be a. Uh... Like, should we talk about this? Because it's kind <laughs> of like the big news and it's very, very funny. <laughs> very funny. And uh, we will get into it, but very also like, you know. Uh, uh, it goes a bit far. It goes a bit far, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, yes. At the moment, we are not streaming this episode live because, of course, like Carl has just been going through his move and everything, and we're still just figuring out setups and all that jazz. But we do usually stream our episodes live um, Wednesdays around 8 p.m. UK time. Yeah. But, you know, it, that's when this episode's going to go live. But. At the moment, yeah, it's just a little bit stressful to to be streaming this week, but we should be back on it hopefully, like maybe next week. Yeah, by, by, I, I'm I was not expecting to be settled in as quickly as I am now because it wasn't just the move; it was get your internet set up, which thankfully was quite speedy. To get your energy supplier sorted out, get like mm -hmm. um, just the house decorated, get all of my stuff out of storage. I managed to get half the stuff, at least my work stuff, out of storage. Actually, get a setup that I'm comfortable with. So. The camera is set up for being filmed for filming from like you know six or seven feet away. I mm -hmm. haven't got the right kind of lens to film this close, so I've had to jury rig. Like my camera is not on a tripod right now; it is balanced on some boxes. I'm telling you, you need to just get one of those uh like pole arms that you clamp to your desk. That that's been a lifesaver for me. Which is what I'll probably end up getting. But the thing is, is like it's that classic thing, isn't it? Of the the bits that you don't see it doesn't matter what they look like. No, exactly, yeah. Because just off camera is like four, 14 boxes that have not been opened and cleared out. Mm -hmm. Because I haven't got the furniture delivered yet to put the things on the shelves. So there's just like, there's boxes that are halfway through being emptied. Like on that time where you needed a teleprompter for recording and you just sent me a picture of like, here's me just stacking up a laptop against like five books. It's not stupid if it works. Yeah, exactly. Redneck engineering. And for anyone that's watching on YouTube, just remember that if you would prefer to, you can find this podcast on most podcast services by simply searching for the Wiki Weekdays podcast. And if you are enjoying the show that way, feel free, feel free to give us a swell review if you feel like we've earned it, if you feel like I can talk enough and say words properly enough that we've deserved a review. You'll get there, mate. All right. We'll get there. We'll get there indeed, but... Yeah, if you are watching over on the video version, just remember you can give us a like, subscribe, ring the bell, all that jazz, do all there's, the funny there's business. There's so many things you have to do, right? Mm-hmm. And what you just like, you just clicked on a video and subscribe, and that was all you need to do. And then YouTube was like, hey, let's make this 14 times more complicated. Do you remember when as well, when you subscribed to a channel, YouTube decided to show you those videos? Oh, yeah, that was great. I used to love that. Now I just get like the same eight videos recommended to me on my homepage every time. That's got to be a mistake, right? I don't know. Uh, the amount of know. like people I've seen mentioned, like there's a video I've watched twice and it just keeps getting recommended. And I, I'll, it'll auto play at night when I'm just listening to go to sleep and I'll wake up to the same video. Mm hmm. Yeah. I don't, it, seemingly, it's not stopped people watching and may encourage more people to watch like repeatedly so they're just going down that avenue it would seem but it it's fucking stupid it'd be nice to watch the new stuff anyway speaking of new stuff what are we talking about today well carl uh i'm not real well i am i am aware i i we always keep up the bit of like well i don't know what you're talking about what are you talking about we did we've just admitted that we know what we're talking about this week and um yep. just like you know um, maybe warnings, trigger yes. warnings for people that are um, sensitive to certain subjects. Uh, this, this is going to go deep, but Carl, let us know what the subject is, of course. Yeah, and to clarify as well, we're probably going to laugh and joke 
throughout like this wiki entry. We're not laughing or joking about the subject matter. We're laughing and joking about how ridiculous it is. Not like this the, situation not the subject has matter. The, the fact that the situation that involves this subject matter has uh, gotten to this level. Yeah, it is a farcical level at this point, but we want to make sure people are aware that like we take the things that are mentioned very seriously, we just don't take this situation seriously. Yeah, so today we're talking about Lucas, the Drake Kendrick Lamar feud. Yeah, like it all started out with a diss track, Carl, and we're now here. We're to to date this podcast for anyone that's wondering. It's the eighth of May, twenty twenty four. So there may be even more. Just bombs fucking dropped. Drake might be in prison right now. <laughs> like, he might, he be might be listening to this. He might be assassinated. One of them is in prison or something. Yeah. He and Kendrick Lamar might have driven like you know just cars into each other's front room. <laughs> yeah. Like this is the start of like a Grand Theft Auto cutscene. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, if anyone who's unfamiliar with the Drake Kendrick Lamar feud, one of the f- right now I'm on the Wikipedia page for it, and it says like the template that this article has is up for deletion, or it's consideration for deletion. And do you know why? It's because they've used the same layout they use for historical conflicts. And if you went to, like, the Battle of the Bulge, and it's, like, belligerence and dates, it's set out like that. So it's, like, Drake on one side, Kendrick Lamar on the other, and it's, like, parties involved. Drake, J. Cole, parties involved for Kendrick Lamar. He's, like, like the allies against the axis of power. Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's a little bit insensitive. But that's the thing, that's how seriously people are taking this. So if anyone's mm-hmm. unfamiliar, the Drake Kendrick Lamar feud. The date was started on March twenty second, twenty twenty four, to present. So that's one month, two weeks, and two days. The medium is diss tracks, and the parties involved are Drake with J. Cole up until April seventh, where J. Cole's like I'm out. I mean, and- that's the thing, right? It's like it, did it start in March, or did it start years ago when they were, like, slyly just getting digs at one another? Which we can get to in a moment, because there's, mm-hmm. like, some historical precedent that is fucking hilarious. And then the other parties yeah. are Kendrick Lamar, backed by Future, Metro Boomin, The Weeknd, ASAP Rocky, Rick Ross, and Kanye West. So, not all winners on his side. And if you'll believe Kendrick, like, half of the people on Drake's team, quote-unquote, like... Yeah. All of his producers' side are like on Kendrick's side, and you know we'll get into it. So the Drake Kendrick Lamar feud, and what makes this really funny is like, do you know like Drake and Kendrick Lamar's full name? Uh, no, Cle- yeah, like, so- I thought Kendrick Lamar was called Kendrick Lamar. Well, he's called Kendrick Lamar Duckworth. Oh, and Drake is called Aubrey Drake Graham. So this is actually yeah. Aubrey Drake Graham versus Kendrick Lamar Duckworth. Which sounds like a like a slap fight between gentlemen in like the nineteenth century, right? <laughs> yeah, they are two very like gentrified sounding names. Yeah, it's 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 like, but they're also like Drake's name sounds lame as fuck. Aubrey, Aubrey Graham is such a lame ass name. Kendrick mm-hmm. Lamar Duckworth is so fucking cool. Oh, that that's a great name, but it does sound like he's some fucking baron in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, but he's just like a rapper. Yeah. I'm not saying just a rap, what I mean is like... Yeah, it, it, of course, yes. He's probably richer than any Baron to ever exist. Because he's a fucking good, like, rapper, that's why. Yeah. It? It's like when you find out that Eminem's real name is actually Marshall Mathers. It's like when mm-hmm. you find out that's actually his name. Do you have, like, a favourite, like, artist, like, real name that sounds cooler than their stage name? Because I think Marshall Mathers sounds cooler than Eminem. It's like oh. 50 Cent. Curtis Jackson sounds way cooler than 50 Cent. That does, yes. I was going to go the other way of... Okay. Um, I just think, like, the name of Childish Gambino is is great. Like, Which that's is. a great stage name. Which is? Um, what's his name now? You don't know. No, I do. It's um the guy who's, like, Troy from Community. Yep. Um, I'm blanking on his name, though. Donald Glover. Donald Glover, yeah, because... I was thinking Donald, and then Trump was coming into my head. And I was like, it's not Donald Trump. I know it's not Donald Trump. Donald Glover. Like, yeah. that's the opposite way around. Donald Glover, a very normal sounding name. Unless Just... you, like, remember his nickname, where he said he first signed up for like, AOL as Don Glover. Realised he'd come up as Don Glover. <laughs> <laughs> well, some other ones I've got here are Snoop Dogg. Do you know Snoop Dogg's real name? 
Um, I've heard it in the past, but I can't remember it off the top of my head. Calvin Cordoza Brodus Jr. How I mean, fucking cool is that? Or oh, Ice Cube, O'Shea Jackson. I get why they changed their name because like, O'Shea Jackson. There's probably a, quite a few O'Shea Jacksons out in the wild. But it does sound fucking cool, right? But so does Ice Cube. Yeah, I guess so. And I love it. Literally his... sounds cool. Uh, he's uh, he got that nickname because his brother tried to put him in like the ice tray as a kid and kept calling him Little Ice Cube. And then Ice Cube made that his rap name. And what a do great you mean he tried to... to put him in the ice tray? The joint, the, the, they had a big freezer and he said his brother kept trying to put him in it and calling him Ice Cube. And then he made that his name so he could own it. And then he said he got famous off that name. And just in the interview he says, yeah, suck on that, Daryl. I'm rich now, you're not. I presume you don't mean he was trying to put him in an ice tray because the only ice trays I own are like fucking maybe about just, six just the, to eight inches big. The ice chest part of a the freezer then. Right, okay, I get you now, yeah. Yeah. The Drake-Kendrick Lamar feud is an ongoing rap feud between Canadian rapper Drake and American rapper Kendrick Lamar. The conflict escalated in March 2024 off the release of Like That by Future and Metro Boomin featuring Lamar. Their first collaboration was in 2011 on Drake's album Take Care, with another collaboration a year later on Lamar's album Good Kid, Mad City. So they were initially on good terms, or at least good enough terms, to collaborate on each other's albums. Well, let me tell you, Carl, they're not on good terms anymore. <laughs> no. Lamar later dished Drake and several other rappers on the 2013 song Control by Big Sean, he, saying he wanted to murder them in music. He clarified that his verse was intended to be seen as friendly competition. I think that's a part of like music that often gets like like overblown, isn't it? Like A mm-hmm. lot of these like beefs sometimes are um, uh, exaggerated. For the sake yeah. of publicity, because all ships rise with the tide. Of course, yeah, it gets people talking just like we are today. And I'm not very, like, involved with this community. I don't really listen to to much of Lamar or Drake's Lucas, music, Lucas. but it has Lucas, expanded to the point where yeah, it's Lucas. like... You don't need to say yeah. that. Just, yeah. But, like, it's gone to the point where, like, this is on, like, American news... Yeah, and shit always, like it is gone way beyond. I found out about it because, like, um, you know, I'm, I I listen to some hip hop. I'm not the biggest hip hop fan. Like people probably tell from the way I look. Eminem. That's about the extent of the hip hop <laughs> I listen to. Which made me laugh because I found out that like a diss that Kendrick Lamar wrote for another rapper was they are the white Eminem, which oh, I wow. think is just a fucking yeah. phenomenal diss, right? It is. It's like I just great. saw this like popping off on Reddit. So mm-hmm. I was like moving between houses, like, oh, like Kendrick Lamar, who I'm familiar with, like some of their songs, like Pimp yeah. Butterfly, really great album. I know they've got a Pulitzer in um, for writing music, one of the first people to, I think, the only person to have gotten one. Oh, wow. Okay. And like, you know, directly name dropped by like Barack Obama as one of like, the voices of an entire generation. And I know mm-hmm. Drake, because Drake's just a fucking weirdo. Well, and like, um, was it Snoop Dogg that basically like, passed a torch on stage to Kendrick, like, you're the next generation. You are the next generation of rappers, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, he is well-respected, and it's always that thing, like, with the the state of, like, Drake, J. Cole, and Lamar, like, they're considered by many, like, as a big three well, in that's... hip-hop. But, like, well, there we go. That's what started this whole thing. Well, yeah, it did, but, like, as you were talking about, like, the sportsmanship, like, friendly rivalry kind of competition-esque part of it is Kendrick doesn't see it that way. He sees himself as the big one and, like, yep. the the best of the best. Well, it was a great... I think it's like there's a, a Drake album. I forget the name of the song, so we're going to not know the name of the but, like, Drake mentions, mm-hmm. like, uh, oh, like, I'm okay with Lamar outselling me because I respect him or something in that vein. And, like, on the Black Panther soundtrack, like Kendrick Lamar did... In that soundtrack, he basically says, I don't care what Drake says because I don't give a fuck about his opinion. Yeah. <laughs> and he's in like a billion dollar grossing movie. Oh, God. Well, um... Speaking of, like, you know, the, the start of the, the feud, in 2023, J. Cole proposed on the track First Person Shooter from Drake's album For All the Dogs that he, Drake, and Lamar were the big three of hip hop. Which uh, I can. Like, you know, from what little information I know, I can understand why that is the case. And this was my first, like, introduction to this beef, because I just saw on Twitter trending The Big Three. 
Mm-hmm. People were asking who are the big three of each fandom. Well, that's and I saw it's it in regards easy to like, call, uh, manga and stuff first. Yeah, I was going to say the big three is One Piece, Naruto, and Bleach, right? Yeah, and that's what I saw that and then found out. Oh, it's it started from a line of J. Cole song. Oh, um, right, okay. Because yeah. I know that, like, obviously, Dragon Ball Z is considered like almost like oh, fuck's sake, before be that time, and it's like almost like one of the grandfathers of anime, and then. The big three at the time when the big three of anime was decided was yeah, Naruto. That's how One that Piece conversation Beach. began online because it was this J. Right. Ultra, and that started trending and that got outside of the ecosystem it began in and just got, took on a life of its own. Uh, the conflict was reignited in March 2024 when Lamar dissed Cole and Drake on the song like that, rejecting the existence of a big three. Insisting that he is like, you know, just there's no big three, it's just me, I think is the line. <laughs> yeah. Which is a fucking money line, right? I mean, fucking half the lines that Kendrick drops are, like... Ah, phenomenal. I, I, I don't really listen to his music, but I can totally respect him just on... As a the lyricist, stuff that I've seen in terms of a lyricist, yeah, just... A, a poor surprise for music. Mm-hmm. And I remember, like, when... I think it was, like, I was streaming, like, a week or so ago, and someone mentioned this on my stream. Like, well, I don't know much about Kendrick Lamar or Drake's... Like, you know, music. All I know is that when I hear Kendrick Lamar's name, it's normally followed or preceded by the greatest rapper on planet Earth alive today. <laughs> when I hear someone mentioning Drake's name, it's normally like, oh, have you heard he's texting underage girls? Yeah. Either or that, his album or like, sucks. Why is it oh, on Spotify? He's a, he's a fucking bitch. <laughs> he's like got shit music or that he's doing very inappropriate things. Never, never good for- things. Never forget, people actually filed a lawsuit, like a class action lawsuit against Spotify, because Drake's album was on the front of Spotify for a week straight and ev- in, in, it was in like every single Spotify curated playlist, even mm. for genres Drake is not a part of. Like you'd be listening to like, you know, a rock and metal playlist, it's like do you want to listen to Scorpion by Drake? And it's like, no, stop pushing this shit album on me, I don't want to listen to it. That's like the Spotify equivalent of when uh, that U2 album was installed on every iPhone and yeah. everyone was like, I don't, I don't want care it. if it's free. I don't want this shit. Take it off. Yeah. And, and here's where, like, you know, the, 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 the feud. So this is like the most interesting, not the, the most, but this is the start of what made it interesting. Mm. Um, Cole then responded to Lamar on the diss track Seven Minute Drill, which Cole thereafter apologised for and removed from all streaming services. And initially, this was seen in the rap world as like, you know, oh, it's a bitch move, mate. Like, you know, mm-hmm. you're know, sticking to your guns. And now that like Kendrick Lamar has been dropping like these nuclear <laughs> missiles on Drake's house, everyone's like, J. Cole is the smartest person in this thing because he immediately realised I'm not going to piss off Kendrick Lamar. Well, I'm not going to piss off the best rapper in the game at the moment because I cannot compete with him. I'm just going to yeah. peace out and apologize. The way I've heard it summed up is just that a lot of you know feuds go one way or the other, but every single person that's ever come at um, Kendrick Lamar has ended up apologizing. Yeah. Apart from Drake so far. Yeah, so Drake then released the songs Push Ups and Tailor Made Freestyle in April. And the latter, Tailor Made, um, is especially noteworthy because it contained AI generated vocals of Tupac Shakur and Snoop Dogg. Specifically so he... because um, Kendrick Lamar has used them both on tracks earlier with permission, right? And it's worth noting that Kendrick Lamar is a longtime friend of the Shakur family. Yes, like, he got permission, he went and, like, went down the actual avenues to be like, hey, can I I use the voice of Tupac in my song, and can I, you know, do it in a respectful way, and Drake just said, fuck it, I'm gonna do the same. And supposedly that was in response to people saying Drake uses ghostwriters, because that's, like, Mm -hmm. a big thing. Ghostwriters are a thing that exists in the music industry, but in the rap world, there's a lot more authenticity, or at least perceived authenticity when it comes to rap, especially if you like rapping about yourself and your experience and the struggles mm-hmm. that you've had, which is always really funny when you listen to Drake's songs, when he's like, I started from the bottom and now I'm here. And it's like, you were on fucking like Nickelodeon. Was like, he? Yeah, he was, he was on like, I think it was Degrassi, I think it was. He's a rich kid. Oh, I didn't like, realize he was like a child actor. I yeah, just only like a, heard of him from like rapping. He's a rich kid, but he talks about like one of the lines in his songs is I start from the bottom, now I'm here. 
mm-hmm. and he's been accused for many years of using Ghostwriter. So supposedly him resurrecting Tupac Shakur. I'm just going to call him Tupac. It sounds too white when I say Tupac Shakur. Yeah, just he resurrected call him Tupac. Tupac so he's got a literal Ghostwriter on his song. Mm-hmm. But then he did it with Snoop Dogg, and the joke was that Snoop Dogg probably woke up and thought he just did it. He probably just thought he got too high and just didn't remember doing the diss. It's I'm still reminded of just like something that obviously is a bit more within like my communities of yeah. gaming and stuff where it was just that headline one day of yeah, uh Snoop Dogg got real high while he was streaming one day and just like left he just left and the stream was still on. Mike, and yeah, Mike. it there was like I think either dozens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people just watching Snoop Dogg's desk. Well, there's the one as well where he got really high and accidentally muted himself on stream. And because he doesn't read <laughs> chat, didn't realise. So he had like three days on the bouncy with stream when no one could hear him and he just didn't give a fuck. Because he's Snoop Dogg. Like, that's the thing is, uh, people it's have summed Snoop up... Dogg thing, right? Yeah, people have summed up Snoop Dogg's life at this point of like, he's just out there doing side quests because he doesn't need any more money. He's, he's done everything. Yeah. He's just doing what he wants. I respect it so much. One of my favourite descriptions of Snoop Dogg is, when I hear Snoop Dogg, I I imagine that he collects like ships in bottles, but instead of ships, it's like figurines of people having sex. (laughs) (laughs) Because that's just like the guy, he's just such a weird dude. (sighs) And that song is no longer available anywhere. You can still listen to it, obviously, because it's on the internet. But Um, the Shakur family's like, fuck you, delete that shit, or we will sue your ass. Also, it is so offensive to the memory of our deceased friend and family member because he really liked Kendrick Lamar. Yeah, it, that's the thing, right? Of He was friends with Lamar. He was used on Lamar's track with permission. Yep. Like, he is a, he is a, a friend of them. Um, Drake, who isn't, just wanted to use his voice as an AI bot as a way to diss off Lamar without getting permission and he's like, not only are you using the voice up without permission, you're using shitty AI you're dissing our friend it's like, absolutely fuck off, we will shut you down. Yeah uh, Drake respond. oh sorry, Lamar responded with Euphoria and 616 in LA on May 3rd and the thing that's like noteworthy about 616 is that he released it five, I think it was like less than an hour after Drake released his song. Yeah, like that's the thing is, I presume they've got these just ready waiting to drop because some of the well, response people, people, times are insane. Because people don't know, like, that again, it's, it's very unclear how much of this stuff was written ahead of time. And mm-hmm. the theory is that does Kendrick Lamar fucking hate Drake? And well, it's not a theory, stuff? Carl. No, the, 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 he hates him so much he had this stuff written for a long time. And there's a right, fact that yeah. Drake recorded an entire music video, and within an hour, Kendrick Lamar dropped another track mm-hmm. that out like outplayed his. And like that's the weird thing is just oh here it is yeah he says it here look so Drake responded to six sixteen in L A with Family oh, yeah. Matters later that day, accusing Lamar of being a domestic abuser and alleging that one of Lamar's children was fathered by another man. So these are like the things where like, we're not making light of this. Yeah, exactly. This is where things start to real get nasty and personal. Yeah. So but- maybe just like skip forward, you know, ten minutes or so if um if that's something that might be triggering for you. Yeah. So we're not making light of that. It's just it's a very surreal situation to be in. Like we're living mm-hmm. through rap history. Because keep in mind, there's not like the last time something like this spilled out into, you know, out of the the rap world, I don't know how mm-hmm. it just, and it was a pop culture sensation, it was like Biggie and Tupac. Right, yes. Yeah. Even like you're back in the day, like even to this day, like diss tracks get people fucking killed. It's like this is like one of the first times where a beef like this has managed to like capture just public attention outside of the initial spheres with which it was contained. Of course, those spheres are very large, very influential. Mm-hmm. But just the fact that, like, me and you, when we look like this, are familiar <laughs> with what's going on. Yeah, that's the thing, is just the fact that it is crept into, like, actual national news in America. It's on the news, yeah. of, like, I think it was, like, on ABC or something, like, here's the, the feud being explained on the news um, well, here we go, Lucas. Af- 
20 uh, minutes one later. One second, Carl. Oh, sorry. Just let me explain this one sec. Okay. So for anyone that's wondering, trigger warning-wise, um, what I'm going to do is just put a little image of Pikachu on the screen. Oh, okay. And when if the Pikachu you see disappears. the Pikachu there, then, like, still trigger warnings exist. When the, just, if you're, like, you know, previewing this and trying to look for someone to go forward, just go to where there's no longer a Pikachu on screen. That'll be yeah. a good way to indicate that, like, we're on to a new conversation. That is a, a very smart way of doing that, Lucas. So, 20 minutes later, Lamar released Meet the Grahams, accusing Drake of, among other things, being a sexual predator, sex trafficking, and fathering a secret second child. And this is one of those things where I, this is where I was first made aware of it. I was aware mm. of, like, the big three. Heard it was something to do with, like, a beef between Kendrick Lamar and Drake, and, like, kind of fell off. The drop of Meet the Grahams... Where it's like, oh, Kendrick Lamar just released a song where he's accusing... This has gone beyond their beefing for, like, publicity. This is where it became clear, like, oh, yeah. these, these guys might just shoot each other. Like, uh, this is no longer at the point where it's like, oh, I'm better than you. It's, no, I have fucking shit to say, and I've got, like... they are, to, to clarify, as far as we're aware so far... No one's got, like, receipts for any of this shit. It's just them slinging accusations at one another. Except for the literal receipts that were on the album or the cover art for Meet the Grahams, which included scans of receipts with Drake's name on it. Oh, right, okay. I have not seen that cover. I saw the one that's, like, coming up where it's, like, each one of the Drake's crews, like, dotted out. Yeah, but I, I've not seen uh, that one with receipts on it. But yes, yeah, um, and this is this... where just just nukes are getting dropped at this point. Just like body blow after body blow, like you know, like Drake's on the ropes asking for help, and just Kendrick Lamar is putting is taking <laughs> the gloves off and putting uh, the heavier the, gloves on to the point where like he actively in this song addresses each member. Of Drake's family, each like paragraph by paragraph, verse yep. by verse, and just basically is like tells his mom, "Your son is like a terrible person and should die." I think what like I saw like the I became familiar with when the Meet the Grahams dropped, mm-hmm. and I just saw the summation of it of Drake's diss track. He made fun of Kendrick Lamar being short. Kendrick Lamar's diss track opens with him telling Drake he should die. <laughs> it's like that is a hell of an escalation, right? It- it really fucking is. But we're not done yet, though, because like Lamar then followed with the release of "Not Like Us," which continued just raining down those body blows on Drake, accusing him of, among other things, pedophilia. And the mm-hmm. thing is, he straight up just calls him a pedophile in the thing. Yeah, which is like, I don't. Is that beyond libel? Uh, that's a thing, right? Is like in the UK. Just putting a song out there, calling someone that, you'd be up for, like, libel straight away. Like, and what's the line, Carl? The Spider-Man line? Oh, um, uh, in print it's slander. Oh, it's, it's libel if it's printed, if it's spoken it's slander. There we go, so it would be But it's slander. written down and it's spoken. I mean, tr- I guess it is written down because it's written into lyrics of a song. And here's the thing about, like, Not Like Us. Not only is it fucking brutal, it's a really good song. Yeah. There's like, there's compilation, like something Kendrick Lamar did as well. He's like, oh, I'm just going to release all the copyrights to these songs so anyone can listen to them. And there's people playing this song in the club already. And there's like, there's, there's TikToks well, they... of this song in the club and people singing along yeah. to the line where Kendrick Lamar accuses Drake of abusing children. And there are people dancing to that line in clubs. I think that's where they've been very clever because, as you say, Lamar's just been like, fuck it, do whatever you want with the song, which meant just every single person who gives a shit was reacting to it on, like, TikTok or on Twitch or on YouTube and just spreading that song further and further. And that's probably exactly why people like Carl and I are talking about this right now and why it's reached levels of, like, us and our spheres. Well, people tried doing it to a Drake song and Drake was sending them, well, not him, but his his studio or his copyright holder was sending people cease and desist. Kendrick Lamar just released them all, which is why there is an amazing compilation of, like, here's, like, a hundred different people listening to the track. Mm -hmm. And their first listen 
almost all of them immediately start crip walking at the pedophile line. And he's like, and just a. He's, like, he's actually a banger. And he's like, this yeah. is going to be. He's in clubs. People are there, dancing in clubs. There to is an admittedly accusation. that. There is that bit where like he he stops the song to like clarify shit for a second, which breaks up a bit. But like generally speaking, there are just people, yeah, absolutely vibe into this in the clubs already. Like some of the lines that live off, like um, live rent free. But I listened to yeah. it a couple of times. So I was like, I was just breaking down like the various bits of the lyrics. Just the line was like, I probably struck a chord, and it's uh, I've, I've must have struck a chord, and it's definitely a minor, and like that's the oh. breakdown. It's like, oh, <laughs> you can't and do this. I think one, you know, other important thing to mention is like the fact as well of like Lamar basically being like, "Hey Drake, you act like a white dude, and you should stop coming around to like, especially Atlanta and the artists there, and like." Every time you're in trouble, you keep going and stealing the talent from there to help you out. And like yeah. you're it's not he's not attacking him because he's mixed. Like he even tells his son, I think I think he was like um like a, a quarter black, maybe I think. Mm. Like you are a black man, you should like deal with that at all times, not just when it suits you. And that's what he's accusing him of, of like Drake taking like almost like acting like a white person and taking like white privilege when he can and when it affords him acting more like a black person and going and like cribbing all these people from the community and from specifically Atlanta and using all their talents and stuff and it's like which is something Kendrick Lamar has been vehemently outspoken about like he is mm-hmm. and, and something that Drake accused on one of his diss tracks is you don't do anything for your people and it's like Kendrick Lamar like every year holds like a big like Christmas toy drive for kids in the area you grew up in in Compton, right? And he's donated and like a... loads of money to schools and stuff for their music programs, and he's there like every single year lending his like his celebrity and um, uh, like you know just financial support. Because that's what Lamar's like really annoyed about is that well, when it suits you, you're willing to like come out and act as like a member of the black community, but when it doesn't suit you, you're not there to support anyone. You're not there to help anyone else out. You're just taking and never giving back, and yep. including the secret daughter that you're not supporting and is apparently out there somewhere. And it is actually wild as well, because like just the fact that like, this stuff was said in a song, mm-hmm. like, a direct accusation has been listened to like what tens, if not hundreds of millions of times by now. Mm-hmm. When like Drake was responding to it, the thing he responded to was like not the accusations of being a sex predator. And did you hear in one of his songs? You, you must have seen like the, the people breaking down the lyrics and stuff. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. His, his defense for, I, I can't have abused children. I'm too famous. I'm not in prison yet. Yeah, I'm too fake. When R. Kelly got arrested last year. And he's like, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't be any of these things you say because I'm not in prison. It's like, are you inviting the situation? Like, what are you doing here? You're not denying any of this. Yep. And, you know, there is a lot of, like, breakdowns of the lyrics and stuff on here. And there is just, like, a more specific breakdown. So should we just go... Because we've got the breakdown of, like, first-person shooter and like that, push-ups and tailor-made freestyle. I mm-hmm. think we should just move on straight to the, the most recent one, Family Matters and Meet the Grahams. I think I think those right now are the two important songs in terms of those are the two where Lamar just took both barrels to Drake and just yeah. took him outside, just like shotgun to the gut. Yeah. Uh, so like you know, just Family Matters. So on May third, as I mentioned, Drake released Family Matters in response to Euphoria and Six Sixteen in LA. In the track, he alleged that one of Lamar's children is not biologically his. Um, claiming that he was actually day free, Lamar's friend and label co-founder, who is the father and of his child. I do think that's an important note, because as much as Lamar went for the killing blow, Drake took it and was the first one to make it personal. As Which far is as someone has noted, yeah, I've seen that noted as well, of like, he made it personal, and like, if you listen to the lyrics of the songs that Lamar released, it's like, if you listen to the lyrics, you can see, you say, I've got more. Yeah, like, essentially, like, say, I've got more material, do you want me to say it? Do you want this to go nuclear? Because apparently he'd just been saying for a while, like, yeah, I've got shit on Drake. Well, I've got a lot of shit on Drake. Like, yep. I'm, I'm ready. Let's go. It's, it's also as well, people have noted how it really speaks to, like, 
the way Drake thinks that accusing someone of loving and raising a child that is not biologically theirs is a sign of weakness. Especially when it's like the opposite accusation is that Drake has a legitimate child out there or like an illegitimate child that he's not willing to admit is his own. Yeah. And it's like, you know, he's doing the complete opposite of ignoring this child completely, not supporting them, even when it is his kid. Yeah. And that's the accusation. We do say all of this is like shots backfired between what each of these two people are saying against one another. We're not making any allegations. Yeah. Have you seen to clarify? Well? Yeah. You know, this is all alleged. Like the battle that's currently going on on like Drake's Wikipedia page. People people keep putting that he's got two kids, and then Wikipedia keeps removing it. So now on his Wikipedia page it says children at least one. And I, which is I the middle wanna, ground they settled on. While you um. Look that up. I'm gonna see if the like tweet is still out there of like what Drake was saying about like I will you know do this if uh, you can find out evidence. But I'll Ooh. get that up in a second. What's the other thing people have been doing as well of like breaking down a lot of his lyrics? But I'll you know continue here. Twenty minutes later, Lamar released another diss track aimed at Drake. That'll meet the Grahams on the track. Lamar speaks as we mentioned directly to members of Drake's family, telling his son Adonis that he is sorry that his father is Drake. He alleges that Drake is hiding a second child, a daughter, and that he is sexually attracted to minors, and that he is running a sex trafficking ring out of his mansion. He disses his um, uh, label affiliates, claiming they are all sex offenders harboured by Drake and security guard. He predicts that Drake's mansion is about to get raided too, referring to recent federal raids on P. Diddy's mansion as part of an unrelated investigation. Oh, shit. So that's the one okay. I was saying, like, I'm too famous. It would have happened. It's like P. Diddy just got raided, like, last week. Yeah. And it's also worth noting as well that Lamar revealing an alleged second child came in the context of Pusha T's 2018 diss track, The Story of Adion, or Ad Don, in which Pusha T publicly revealed that Drake was hiding a son named Adonis. So this has already happened once. So Drake being like, there's no way that can be oh. true. It happened with your son. Oh, I didn't realise that that already happened with his first kid. It happened, and he's like, well, there's no way it can happen. Lucas, what are the odds of it happening twice? <laughs> the odds of it happening once is ridiculous, but twice? And similarly, Drake also responded, like, you know, to that guy saying this is not true, before admitting that it was true. Mm. Oh, what were you looking at, Lucas? I was trying to find, like, the specific quote. Um from Drake of like, well, I will, you know, if you find evidence that I have a secret 11-year-old daughter, I will quit my job yeah. and, like, go come and work for you or whatever he said. But I couldn't find the direct quote, but basically, yeah, he specified, ha, there's no way that you could prove that I've got an 11-year-old daughter. Also, I did like what people immediately tore that down. Like, Drake, asking someone to bring you an 11-year-old girl is not the, the defense you think it is, <laughs> considering what else was said. And that's the thing that's worth noting as well. For culture, this has been phenomenal. Like, for mean mm. culture, just the fact that everybody is just dunking on Drake is so funny. Yeah. It's so funny because, like, that's the thing about a beef like this. Like, it's not really who releases the better song. Although Kendrick Lamar, has Lamar has already the best won in that department. It's like it's about, and it's not about winning. The like, sorry, winning is about like you've got to capture the hearts and minds of the people, mm -hmm. and I think it's universally good. Just Kendrick Lamar's won. There is no coming back from what he said because it's... not only are the accusations horrendous and life ruining, if career ruining, if true, it's a really good song. Yeah, and. That's the thing. The songs that Lamar has dropped are better anyway, but that's not the point. The point is that who's going to win, like, the feud, the battle, if you will. But, like, yeah, unless Drake has the best thing he's ever written and the hardest allegations he's got behind, like, just up his sleeve somewhere, I, I don't see how there's any coming back from this. It's also... Like worth noting as well, like Kendrick Lamar's not released an album in like four years. He's released half an album's worth of content just saying Drake's a dickhead. Also, what a bitch move by Drake of Lamar. Uh, I think it's like before he releases each album, he does like a drop of The Heart. Mm -hmm. So he'll do like The Heart Part 2, The Heart Part 3. And Drake stole his title for the next part 
and released the heart part six to defend himself from these allegations. It's yeah. like you you just did that to to just be a dick, and it's like you essentially like crib the title of his next the heart song just to piss him off a little bit more. It's like this guy is already like he's already got the boot above your head. Yeah. He's coming down. Do you want him to stop <laughs> and put the cleats on? Because he'll go get the cleats. So he's already got two bars of super. Do you oh. want to give him that third bar? Do you want him to do you want to give him the critical art right now? Oh, get that level three going. It's, he's already got the level level three, but do you want him to do the level five? No one wants it. <laughs> so on May 4th, um, 2004, Kendrick Lamar released Not Like Us. In the track, Lamar more explicitly refers to Drake and members of the inner circle as pedophiles, saying, Say Drake, I hear you like him young. You better not ever go to cell block one. And obviously Kendrick Lamar says it better than me. Backer, a member of Drake's security team, is mentioned in the line, Backer got a weird case, why is he around? Referring to when Backer was arrested and charged with sex trafficking, assault and robbery of a 22-year-old woman, he allegedly forced into prostitution. And it is very, very telling that Drake poorly defended himself, but didn't even attempt to defend any of his crew. There's also like a bunch of just weird stuff that he's confirmed to have done. Mm. Like, there's multiple confirmed cases of him getting his security details to beat people up while he watches. That was a case where I think it was like some tattoo artist went viral, kind of, because someone came into their tattoo shop and said, can I get a tattoo on my face saying Drake's name? And mm. he said no, and Vice interviewed him and he went viral because he said, because Drake's a shit rapper. Drake went to his tattoo shop to demand an apology and sat in his car outside tweeting on his phone while he sent his security guy in to rough up the tattoo artist. Jesus Christ. And the tattoo artist just kicked the fuck out of his security guard and kicked him out of his shop. Because <laughs> the tattoo, like the tattooist was in like a really rough part of Harlem or something. I right. think some like overpaid security guard's gonna scare me. People with guns come in every day. <laughs> and like Yeah, I, I do find it weird as well, just like the whole uh, you know, on a separate note, that whole discussion of like people's likeness getting tattooed on them and there was that whole, like, Kat Von D case that set the precedent for it of, like, um, the she used a photo as reference to get a portrait put on, like, tattooed on someone. Yeah. And then the photographer sued Kat Von D for, like, using his art without permission, which is, is, is Technically valid. Is, but what do you do? You can't delete the but, tattoo. Like, I mean, you can. There is sure. tattoo removal, but, like, Would I that guess be tra- him... Pay him a split of the fee for the tattoo. Surely that'd be transformative at that point, though, because it's, I would, li- it's I would... literally in another medium. Yeah, the human that's the body. thing. Is like, I would have assumed that just that translation from photo to tattoo would be considered transformative, but clearly that case? photographer didn't want to see it. But like, what about the case of yeah? Can you get like Drake tattooed on me? Presumably, he's like, got could that, like... Drake come after the artist legally? Could they come after the person who got the tattoo? We tried to, and like the tattooist wasn't like having none of it. Mm-hmm. Which but like, just... I'm only like, you know, what? What's the press? Like, if I got Drake's face tattooed on me, could Drake sue me? Maybe. I think he he's got other things to worry about right now, though. <laughs> yeah, like so maybe right. like, if this you, if you is wanted the to get a tattoo to of Drake, now's the time to do it. I don't but want you to. did. You did mispronounce Kat Von D's name there, because Kat Von D is like um, anti-vaccination. Oh, so have you heard that joke no. that her name stands for Cat Vaccinate Dem Kids? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Lamar was also um, critical of using an AI version of Tupac's voice, claiming it would bring him into disrespect in the Bay Area. Now, I'm not going to quote this verbatim, mm-hmm. because this is a rap song. So I'm just going like, to you know, quote half of it. I think that Oakland show is going to be our last stop, he says in the song. And he hints that many of having many, made many future diss tracks. The guy's got an album's worth. The cover That's art for the track. Like, yeah, he's got more. How much has he got saved up? The cover art for the track was a satellite image of Drake's house labelled with pins that represent sexual predators. God. Like, he does not care. No, no. On May 5th, 2024, Drake released The Heart Part 6, which you mentioned, Lucas. The mm-hmm. title reference Lamar's The Heart series, picking up after Lamar's critically acclaimed The Heart Part 5. In the track, Drake denies the paedophile and grooming allegations made against him. He claimed Lamar's accusations were based off his own trauma stemming from abuse that he suffered. 
And this is the thing that's real, which is fucking rough, right? He says, oh, you can't possibly, you're wrong about it because you yourself were abused as a child. Which is is totally fucked up. That's some abusive behavior right there. Lamar is specifically coming at Drake and his crew, whereas Drake is insulting anyone that has gone through that shit. Also, uh, I saw a breakdown of this, but I was like, just explain the lyrics to the song where Lamar mm. talks about how I wasn't abused, but my mother was. Right. And because she was, she wouldn't believe that I wasn't. Or at least that's the recollection and the breakdown of it I saw. So what Drake's right. actually doing is just. It's even more fucked up than, like, you know, denying the experience of an abuse victim. He's denying the existence of, like, generational abuse. Mm hmm. Which is just, just all kinds of fucked up. Yeah, it, that's the thing is, like, he's taking it a step even further than, like, taking it personally anymore. Like, he's just insulting anyone that might have been abused. Also, just his ability to defend himself is really poor because he samples yeah. the Aretha Franklin song, Prove It. And uses Franklin's lines. Now let me see you prove it. Just let me see you prove it. Drake says, only fucking with Whitney's, not Millie Bobby Brown's. I never looked twice at no teenager. This is a reference to Drake's friendship with the actress that started when she was 14. And if you're familiar oh. with like, the, oh, how fucking weird that was where Millie Bobby Brown talks about how, yeah, I text Drake all the time. He says that he misses me and he gives me advice on boys when she was 14 and he was 30. And that makes a, a little bit more sense in terms of, like, he was a kid actor as well, but, like, still doesn't stop it being creepy as fuck. It's really, not to mention as well, there's, like, been some really problematic lines from Drake in his songs, such as, if she knows her ABC, she's ready for the D. That's a line that Drake put in one of his songs. Also, probably the funniest tweet oh. he ever put out when he was watching the Predator movie of, this Predator, I think it's something like, Man, this is not this predator is not very good. You put me in the jungle and you'll see a real predator. And then deleted it like immediately afterwards because he realized how bad it looked. Oh my god. And that's just been screenshotted hell. and he's now all over the internet. That's the thing, if when it's on the internet, it exists forever. But Drake also alleges that his inner circle fed Lamar false information about having an eleven year old daughter. And I love the idea that his defense is, aha, it was all fake. Why did they feed you the most heinous Accusations possible. Yeah. Why couldn't he cheat on his taxes or something like that? Yeah, exactly right. Like he cheats on his taxes or like. Why you know... couldn't it have been a misdemeanor, not you've abandoned a second child? Yeah. Uh, he continues claiming that there were cases of domestic violence in Lamar's relationship with Old Ford and claimed that Lamar had not seen his children in six months. Writing on social media afterwards, Drake predicted Lamar would respond shortly, saying, And we know you're dropping six minutes after instead of posting my address. You have a lot to address. And it's like... Again, just yeah. like, not defending himself very well. Not a very good song. And Lucas, Lucas how, just the, the idea that his defence is, hey, you're a paedophile, and his defence is, no, I'm not. It's prove it. Prove it. I'm not in prison yet. It's like, what are you on? What is that defence? Oh, and yeah, as I say, also just not defending anyone that he associates himself with. Of course, yes, and if, like, hopefully, as we clarify at the start, we're not laughing at any of his subject matter. It's just the fact that this is this is going to be written about in textbooks. Mm. Uh, this is now a part of music history. This is like up there with like the beef between Biggie and Tupac. I mean, it's probably going to end up that way, yeah. Yeah, and like keep in mind that ended with t- both people involved being shot. But just the, like, you know, um, I can't remember the exact location that he said, but, like, oh, your last show will be here. Like, that's a, that's a pretty heavy indication. Yeah. And that's that's the kind of shit as well, where you say it, and it's almost like you're manifesting it because millions of people are going to listen to that and go, oh, that's, like, my bat signal Yeah. to go so- and do something about it, to make that true. Well, that's the thing, apparently, like, someone already shot up Drake's house. Yeah, yeah. Which is one of those things, like, no, this is an ongoing story. Not every element of it is something that's... I was, like, me and you had a long conversation before we did this video, like, is this even something we should talk about? Mm-hmm. But it's, like, it's one of those things where it's such a huge moment in culture. Like, it's I'll, hard not to talk it, about it It's right hard now. not... It'd, yeah. be weird if, it'd be weird if we didn't at least mention it. And I just thought, just the idea that it's happening... That's what um, I find fascinating, the fact that this is happening, like, two massive musicians basically having a shit-flinging match on the world stage. 
Yeah, the fact that it went from, like, I'm better than you to, oh, I'm just dropping the heaviest of accusations on well, you. Well, it reminds me a little bit, and I'm going somewhere with this, like, uh, and again, I apologise for the subject matter. This is very, very dark subject matter. Mm. The the case of, um, uh, what's his full name now? You know, did Jim will fix it? Oh, Jimmy Savile. Jimmy Savile, mm. which... Go look at his Wikipedia page when you know the like the stuff like that. I mean, himself. probably it, don't it, at this point. It's real bad. But after the accusations came to light, after he was dead, there was a the documentarian Louis Theroux who did a he used to do a series of My Weekend with where it would be him hanging out with some celebrity whose star had since set uh, star had faded, just mm-hmm. to see what what is life like hanging around with Paul Daniels. What's it like hanging around with Jimmy Savile? And Louis Theroux went back and did a follow-up documentary to that documentary where he got a bunch of unreleased footage. Mm. And he's examining it. Of, basically, throughout this all the footage, Jimmy Savile is all but confirming all of the worst accusations about him were true. And he's effectively just daring anyone to say anything about it. And like Louis well, Theroux has a breakdown midway through. Like He was basically admitting it on camera. But it's such a heinous thing. And mm-hmm. It's so brazen. You wouldn't you wouldn't think someone would be that stupid. But, but it turned... apparently it was like it got to the point where basically everyone that was anyone in the BBC knew what was going on. But Jimmy just had that power to shut everyone down. And that's one of the things that Louis Theroux comes to the conclusion of. It's like why Why would... if? Because it's that thing, you almost can't believe that someone who's done something so heinous would just talk about it or jokingly admit to it. It's like, mm-hmm. but the people who do this, they get off on power. And what's mm-hmm. the ultimate power? Of knowing that they, like, you could be caught at any moment, but won't. Like, it's the ultimate like high for a, an abuser, for a manipulator, mm-hmm. to manipulate and abuse by proxy everybody. Like You were going to gaslight the entire world into believing you. Which is like, it's just another, like, you know, just bit of armor that deflects criticism away from any victims. Mm-hmm. Because it just makes him look that much more untouchable, which, despite it, ironically enough, makes it harder for victims to speak up. Because mm. what are they going to say that's any worse than what he's done? It reminds me a little bit of that, of just how wild these accusations are. And the fact that Drake's just sat there submitting to them, or like goading people into trying to prove them. And I'm not saying I, I believe them. I think it's fucking yeah, we're weird. Not, we're just listing allegations from partner to partner. We're not saying that we believe any of this necessarily, but the defense is very weird of like, fine, prove it. Prove it. Well, don't. It's like um, in a less, and it probably it feels a bit flippant to compare these two things. But like you know, when people get caught for plagiarism, mm. now, what normally it's like their first thing is like prove it, because they're just so convinced that they're much, so much smarter than everybody else. You get high in their own supply. And I, ironically, um, what Drake is saying that they have done um, of planting like a false message to be believed in all those allegations about the daughter is exactly one way that they try and prove plagiarists is like yeah. put in a false piece of text that's completely like you know doesn't make sense or has nothing to do with the subject or whatever. Just put that in, put a line in there as like a little red flag. Yeah, it's uh, Map Towns, I think it's called. It's like an old plan mm. site, because maps to stop people from just like ripping off maps. It's hard to prove that someone ripped off your map, because a good map will be an accurate, you know, just descriptor of the area. How do you yes. prove they ripped off your map and didn't just send someone out there and they come up with basically the same map, because it's a map? Mm. They would make fake towns that did not exist and put them on their maps. So they knew if someone copied that detail, the only way they could have gotten it is by copying their map. Because if they'd actually gone out and done a survey of the area, they would not have seen that town because it does not exist. Yeah, because realistically, every good map should look the exact same. So how do you prove that they're copying you? Same thing. I think Trivial Pursuit did it for a while as well. Because you can't copyright facts and trivia because Mm -hmm. they're facts and trivia. So Trivial Pursuit would occasionally just make up stuff Mm. And put them in so they'd know if people were like you no know, wholesale stealing their trivia or their questions, like pub quiz questions and stuff like that, intentionally mm. putting like a wrong answer in, so you know someone's stealing your stuff. 
But, you know, we're getting a bit far off course here. And we are. Again, are. I'm not sure if that's the thing we should have talked about. And I would like to clarify one more time. We're not making light of any of the subject matter. It's just a, a very interesting conversation, which ultimately is what Wiki Weekends is about on Wiki Week Days. We're, we're trying to keep it as lighthearted as we can when it's we're meant to be making a relatively lighthearted podcast. And we try to stay away from, like, horrible discussions on here when people try and suggest that we cover, like wars and war crimes and stuff like we always say no because like we find it distasteful and that's why we're not really getting too deep into like the actual accusation side of it it's more that we wanted to talk about how wild the feud has gone yeah because it, it seems so insane that it's gone this far like it's like mm-hmm. it's got to the point now where you have one of like the two two of the biggest musicians on earth at the point where they might shoot each other in public mean you'd think it was farcical but it's not like it hasn't happened in the past it's also like if you said last week like oh come on what's the worst thing you can say it's a a song like really Mm -hmm. how much do you really give a shit like what's the worst thing you can say in a song oh god no yeah oh it went way further than we like just open up with i think your son should die well that's one of the things because i heard that and there's no way it's that bad because i saw like Mm -hmm. surely she's just people like overreacting like you know to get you know, clicks on YouTube or whatever, so they can have like their crazy thumbnail. Like, oh my god! And then I listen to it. I do the same thing. I'm like, are you allowed to? Cause I'm only thinking the face of. How did this get cleared? Yeah. How did this get cleared? And, and that's like, notably just the power that Lamar has to be able to get something like that put out. I don't think like you check with anyone. I think he just he doesn't care, which is even scarier. Well, I think um, he has his own production label or something, right? Most likely, yeah. So I think he just doesn't need to care. I also like um, as well where um, uh, again, it's, just, it's it's real bad, but it did make me laugh. Of like Drake released a PG thirteen version of his response and put it on his like official thing, and everyone's like, "This is a real weak response." Like you know, you like you're censoring the swear words in your response to a mm. diss track that accused you of this stuff. And I was like, "We've well, got to keep it PG thirteen because that's his primary audience." And it's like the jokes write themselves. Yeah, and the fact that he's basically become a joke. I mean, like, I'm not gonna lie. I've always seen Drake as a bit of a joke, but, but he always. But the thing that's is, just he always me from the outside. But he always put himself forward as like a tough guy. Mm-hmm. I always I think he's like he always calls himself like lover boy and stuff on all his albums, and I like, have this really, really manufactured image of like just a gangster. And that's it. It feels really manufactured with Drake, which is what Lamar's even getting at. Yeah, like is he, that he's like a this like parasite on a culture that he's not part of, where it feels so fake. And that's like kind of what I, I I've always kind of that's why I've always kind of seen Drake as a bit of a joke because it it does feel fake. It does feel manufactured. It's very it's, strange. It is. It is a very strange situation. I have no doubt this. This episode will be out of date within the week. Within the week, which means that my discussion that I'm going to bring is like going to be on the back half of this podcast that's going to be immediately outdated. That's things like people are like, presumably yours is going to be the thumbnail. And I'll be like, when, do, when are they going to get to the fireworks I, factory? No, we're going we're gonna, to, we're, I can't not put like either Kendrick or Drake or one, like, but one or both on the thumbnail here. I can't not. Okay. Like, I, I can't not, because, like, people are going to be interested in my subject, but it's not going to be, like, the moment of the fucking year like this is. It's like, yeah. Like I said, it is, it is fascinating that this is happening. Mm-hmm. Like I said, it's CNN is talking about this. The BBC yeah, yeah. is reporting on it. Like, this has become A actual moment. notable news. Is like, said, oh, Lamar just said... Your son should die on a fucking song. Like, this has gotten to, as far as I'm aware, pretty unprecedented levels. I can't think of any moment in music that was this big. Mm. I think the last moment that probably got this much coverage was probably like the Janet Jackson um, uh, Super Bowl moment where like Justin Timberlake like grabbed her outfit and revealed her breast. Oh, right, yeah. Or maybe like the death of Michael Jackson or something. And people are going to be like, oh no, just Taylor Swift existing. It's like, yeah, I guess, but like Taylor yeah, Swift yeah. is more like, it's more about 
Taylor Swift as a person yeah. than necessarily like yeah the, the her album double like double album drop in was big but it wasn't a conversation I've seen around it. Way more people talk about this than that album drop in. Yeah, well, that's there's not much to say in regards. To it. It's like she released an album; it was okay. This is like there is a discussion to be had here. Yes, exactly. Like party lines are forming. Mm-hmm. And I, I do, as you say, um, earlier in the podcast, think that J. Cole was just the smartest person in the world out of all this. Of like, Immediately. you know what? I'm gonna write a song in seven minutes, apologize, and then peace the fuck just, out. Just dipped out. It's not my yeah. problem anymore. <laughs> I can see where this is going. It's like, I'll like, wipe my hands of this and back like, in the let the wild like the bear into the room. Yeah, he, he smeared the honey on himself, and then he went, "This is stupid." Yeah, he wiped the honey off. He apologized <laughs> to the bear. He left. He just he, he put himself out of bait and went, "No, this is a bad idea." No, I mean, he just sat there, he's smearing the honey on his balls, and went, "This is stupid. Why am I doing this? I should leave. <laughs> this is a bad idea. This is going to end poorly." And a wise decision considering the next few drops that Lamar made. So, yeah, yeah, maybe that was a wise decision out there. Yeah, just lateral for Drake. Whoop. <laughs> Your problem now. Oh, but I don't, I don't even know how I'm going to follow this up, Carl. How are we going to segue this one? How are we going to segue this one? Maybe just let's take a break. Okay. Because I need to go to the toilet anyway. Cause okay. Like, I think I need a minute just to get in a different headspace and we can... It's, uh... it's, it's weird, right? Ooh, yeah. Right, I'll do the same thing then. Back in a sec. So I now have a cup of tea, Lucas. I've moved from tea to coffee. A, a move I like to call the toffee. So before we get <laughs> on to your wiki entry for this week, um, it's time to do some housekeeping. So my housekeeping is real easy. Um, I'm still in the process of moving. Like I said, it might look like my house is clean at the moment. There are boxes and boxes off stage off stage, off camera, <laughs> so I won't be um, streaming or anything this week, but next mm-hmm. week I should be back to my usual schedule. That'll be like Metal Gear Rising and Vengeance on a Friday and joining you for Mass Effect Mondays, I believe, from next week, yes? Yeah, that's what I was going to mention, is yes. that I, I hadn't confirmed with you that you were okay to do it from next week, but we have hit my sub-goal to start our Mass Effect 3 playthrough. We've already done one and two, but... If you would like to join us for Mass Effect Mondays, we're going to be playing through Mass Effect 3 and its DLCs, um, and Carl will finally get to play the Citadel DLC with me for, yeah, for the first I, time. I've only ever seen like clips of it and stuff online, because I could just never afford it as a kid. Or a teenager, I suppose. But yeah, that should be fun. Yeah, so uh, Monday nights, um, I always go live. Between like about uh, 10, half 10 UK time uh, over on twitch.tv slash Legend of Canto. And then Tuesdays, I do Tunic Tuesdays for Zelda, and I do Thunder Badge Thursdays for Pokemon on Thursdays as well. Yes. Like I said, my streaming schedule will be back to normal next week, so I just wasn't sure how much or how little would have gotten done before then. It seemed mm-hmm. like things are going suspiciously well in my purchase of this property, which, as a British person, I'm always secretly like, you know, suspectful that something bad's going to happen when things go well. That's always the... The, like problem isn't it if just when things start going well i think just the natural response is to be like wait what's going on this isn't right what's it's wrong like, yeah it's like it's not it's the british way to be naturally suspicious of things going well because yeah. just living in britain you get used to everything being shit all the time i mean that's the thing like we're all living in a country that is just not even falling apart it may have just fallen apart at this point yeah. and the idea of something going well in like this country at this day and age, it just doesn't feel right. It's an alien concept, yeah. So while things are going well, um, at any time they could cease to go well. Because like, you know, the purchasing of a property is just naturally something that's going to potentially have a lot of things that could go wrong. Thankfully, none of those things that could go wrong have gone wrong yet, but they could. So just that's be mindful thing. of that if you want to like follow my content or you know, expect to uh, be able to follow me elsewhere. I might just at some point just not be available. The the way I've heard it summed up is like it's like a hurdle race. Of like yeah. you get over the first hurdle and you feel like you you're feeling good. But the problem is there's still another bunch of ha- hurdles to get over. Yeah. And even the final hurdle could take out the entire operation and just set you back to square one. Absolutely, yes. There's also the British um uh, I forget the word for it now. It's like a it's a turn of phrase in the UK of it's Soslaw. It's, mm. it's 
similar, though distinct from Murphy's Law, which is like if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. Sword's Law is just, if something's going to go wrong, it will go wrong at the most inopportune moment, because that's yeah. just Sod's Law. If it's going to fuck up, it's going to fuck up in the most annoying way. Yeah, it's like, it's not like you're, going, you're not just going to... If you wear a white shirt, that's the day you're going to spill something on yourself, because that's Sod's Law. Mm-hmm. It's that thing of like, if it's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong in the most catastrophic way possible, because that's Sod's Law. Yeah, and it's just one of those things of like, yeah, bear, bear with Carl and bear with us in general, just as like, things are going well. But always there's that little niggling thought in the back of your head of like anything could go wrong at any moment, and there's nothing you can do about it as well. Mm-hmm. Especially when it comes to purchasing somewhere. So I'm purchasing this property. I'd like a value will come around today. I went, oh yeah, we shouldn't have any issues um, uh, valuing this property at what like you know the bank has said. And then he added that little caveat because I was I was feeling too secure. Like, well, the bank can always change their mind. So thanks, mate. <laughs> because they can. A bank at any time can change its mind. Oh, yeah, it's a very fucked up process. But speaking of things going wrong at any possible moment, Carl... Okay, where is this going? Where is this going? We're going to my subject for the week. We are basically an entire podcast's worth in before we started my my subject. Technically, my, well, pod- my entry was two entries. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, we are talking about the video game Hades. Okay. And specifically Hades, the 2020 game, not Hades 2. I figured Hades 2, just coming into early access, would be a good excuse to talk about one of the best fucking games I've ever played. No exaggeration, one of the best video games ever made. Mm -hmm. When they say, like, what is one of the best video games ever made, like, Hades is up there. It's just the most video game video game I've played in a long time. Like, Hades for three years was my video game. Of choice, mm. if I ever want to train, I've been trouble sleeping. Yep. Get up my switch, play Hades. For the, uh, for quite a long time now, since um, the Binding of Isaac was back as like a flash game, roguelikes have always been the ones for me where it's just great, cool. All it is is you get in a run. You might do well, you might do poorly, but it's just a good way to kill a couple of hours. But there's, there's something about Hades. There's just but something. Hades is a uh, uh, finding special. Isaac, I'd like say is like another game that is like fantastically special in a very different way because just like the uh, like fucking amount of content in that game and the way that it all interacts with one another. But Hades is special in just like a, a very different way of like being so fucking polished. Po- uh, polished is the right word. If I, I don't think I played a video game as polished as Hades, in a good long while, where just Mm -hmm. everything, from the sound, to just like the snappiness of when you dash. Like The first time I got hands on it, here's like your dash, and it's like... To the art style, which is fucking phenomenal. The art design and the direction of every character having just an absolute 10 on 10 money design. Yeah. And like... Hades 2 Early Access came out, or the technical test came out a couple of weeks ago. And it's already bigger and, than Hades 1. Well, I was just going to say, I thought one thing that was hilarious was people started being like, hey, since when was Hades so gay? <laughs> and it's like, did you play Hades 1? Like, Zagreus I'm is canonically every... bisexual. Yeah, Zagreus is. Also, and like, it's based on Greek myth. One of the gayest pantheons. Mm-hmm. The pantheon is so gay, and like every everyone is fucking everyone, and everyone is half naked. Everyone looks so good, and just like I don't know how you could ever play Hades one and see all the artwork for all those characters and be like, oh yeah, this is like the straightest of shit. The single strongest fighter in that universe is canonically in a gay relationship, and as well just. The thirst trap that is everybody's profile art. Well, that's the thing as well. Like, you say the thirst trap. The thirst trap is every fucker in that game. Like, oh, that's what I meant. It's every like, single character in that game is hard work for every character is fucking thirsty as shit. And it's just and, like, like the best way possible. Yeah. Like, 
I'm just trying to check. Who's like the guy who trains you? It's not Theseus, because I was confused there. Theseus um, is the dickhead who teams it with the Minotaur. Who's the guy who trains you? Oh, this yeah. It's been a while since I played it. I'm trying to remember, because he's not Patroclus. He's the guy he's dating. Achilles. No, Achilles. Achilles. Yeah, because yeah, it's Achilles' sing- heel, yeah. The single strongest man in the entire universe is canonically in a gay relationship with Patroclus. Yes. And you can also hit on them. You can, of course you can hit on You can hit on everyone. Like, that's the thing. Zagreus is just He's up for a round of golf with everyone. He's up for it. And you can, you can enter into a, like, you know, um, uh, a non-monogamous relationship. Yes. You can be yeah. dating Thanatos, the god of death, and Megara, the fury, at the same time. And I love as well when you that gets proposed and Zagreus is like, I can date you both. And Megara <laughs> says, you live forever, dipshit. Why would I say, why wouldn't you commit to one person forever? You are a god. You will live until the end of time. Mm-hmm. But and why it's would just you, a, like, tie yourself down? It's such a cool and very, very extremely thirsty interpretation of the, the Greek gods. But, but the fact that, everyone, that pantheon, everyone looks good. Everyone looks so good. But, like, that, you know, if you look at the law of that pantheon, like, yeah, everyone is fucking everyone. But not to mention as well, it's... Because I think when Stella Blade, because I think the Hades 2, a lot of their like renders for the characters came out around the time of Stella Blade, and Weirdo was mm-hmm. like, well, how come people have been all horny for Hades' as art, but Stella Blade's bad? It's like, because Stella Blade is very, aimed at a very specific type of attraction. It's like very male gazy. This mm, is clearly made by yes. horny dudes with like one hand in their pants. Hades, there is something for everyone in Hades. Like, if you like there just is. hot books and women, you know, you've got, um, uh, Oh, goddess of love. Aphrodite. Aphrodite's right there. Mm-hmm. But if you like, you know, big buff men, take your pick. What about also, I think it's, it's Hephaestus now, God of the Forge. Like he's now been revealed and he's got like a wheelchair oh, and a, okay. um, a, um, like a I, robot I haven't limb. seen much of the actual artwork for the characters in Hades 2 yet. I've been trying to to keep my eye off it a little bit because I'm waiting for it to like Lucas, it's just in my, come out fully. Yeah, it's in my Steam thing and I'm like, do you know that Lois meme where she's looking mm. at the pills and I'm like, it's right there, it's 20 quid. It's the first time I've been like actively tempted to play a game in early access. I Look, normally just like to wait for 1.0. When I read the thing off, in early access there's already more content than there was in Hades 1. Yeah. And I'm like, and it's 20 quid. Yeah. But yeah, I'm almost, very tempted. It's, yeah, it's like, the but, thing as well, right, is like with Hades 1, it was a Switch game for me. And I don't want to play it on PC necessarily. Like I don't want to be sat here. I don't have yeah, it's like, a Steam Deck or anything. I, I don't want to like, be sat sit here on my at my desk play playing Hades, it. But at the same time, I think I could take the weekend off put my PC into my living room, which has like my nice. So previously, <laughs> I could never actually watch TV or a film. They had a big mm. TV. We just sat in the. Remember, like we try to play Smash on it. Yeah. Where's like crowd around like on my bed playing it because there was nowhere to actually sit and play games in my room because the entire house is my office. I actually mm. now have a proper theatre set up. And I could just put my take my tower through, plug it in, and just like lose the weekend to play Hades. And it's twenty quid. It's tempting. It's real tempting. Yeah, and like I said, every design, but getting back to the thing of like, yeah. Every mm-hmm. taste is catered to. And the game is very clearly written by people from a variety of backgrounds. Mm-hmm. And I think it's just been called like this is like the most bisexual game ever made. And a bunch of people who like, identify as bisexual or of them uh, queer have like just taken ownership of the game mm-hmm. because it is so just unapologetically celebratory. Which is why I just found it wildly hilarious that you know the people who were angry about like woke shit needed something to be mad at for the day and was like, "Why is Hades two so gay?" It's like, did you ever see what Hades one was? It's like Theseus the rocks up. the gayest shit there was. Theseus the... rocks up and he's just all oil. He's got the big oil pecs. Like, man, like, I don't know who looked at Hades and went, yeah, yeah, totally non-woke game over here. Especially when I don't use I We use the term woke ironically to make fun of the people who unironically use it, of The course. fact it's, it's like... set in the Greek pantheon. Mm-hmm. It's like, do you just think the Greek pantheon is God of War? And specifically God of yeah. War 1, 2, and 3? Is that what you think of this pantheon? Mm-hmm. 
Oh dear. But yeah, Hades is a 2020 roguelike action role-playing game developed and published by Supergiant Games, who hats off to Supergiant Games. Like they the Have they ever made a bad record game? Record is like well let's let's look quickly at their release games because I believe as far as I'm aware. Okay, yeah, um I'm right in saying Bastion Transistor. Higher Hades and now like early access Hades too. Of the like, only game they made a sequel to, yeah. Never fucking missed so far. Just I know maybe not many as not many people played like Transistor and Pyre, but they were both phenomenal fucking games as well. And like Bastion, obviously was massively popular as was Hades. But and I think the thing as well about um, yeah. uh, Super Giant Games is they never made like DLC or anything. They just made Hades. It's a f- I remember me and you talking about like it, I get why they haven't, but hot damn, would I just immediately drop twenty quid if they said, "Here's DLC for Hades. Here's just like tw- like ten new gods, new mm-hmm. items, new weapons, done." And they went, "Now we'll do one better. Here's just an entire new game." Yeah, yeah. And I, as much as I respect Super Giant so far, as you know, the people who wanted to move on and make a different game. I'm so glad they're making a Hades too. It's so good. And they go, who's your favourite character from Hades then? You can't say Zagreus. So who's your favourite god? Like, who's your favourite god in terms of their look? And who's your favourite god in terms of the boon they grant? Okay. Um, so in terms of the boon they grant, probably Zeus. The lightning, I, the lightning, that's the other thing, the builds you can do. Like Zeus's lightning builds are really good. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of design, maybe Artemis. Oh yeah, the Huntress. Yeah, I thought she had a really cool design. I think for me, and uh, my favourite boon ended up being Dionysus. I mean, that was the other one in terms of design that I was going to say. Just the party. I just like just getting the party started of like his whole the thing. The party, isn't it? yeah. Because it's not big burst damage, but the idea of if you've got like a full Dionysus build and it's all about getting people real drunk. I don't mm-hmm. think we're pronouncing all these names correctly. That's the thing where it's just, I'm like, yep, yeah, cool. Yeah, I'm, we say these how we say these, but yeah. Uh, Dionysus. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing them correctly because like they, they do say them with the correct um, I believe it actually, um, Dio Nai 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 Nai. That's how to pronounce it. Yeah. Whatever, God of the Party. Him. Yeah. And then my favorite design, it's like it's a cross up between um, Athena. I love that they have like the little owl from uh, mm. the little owl's part of her design from um, uh, Clash of the Titans. Mm hmm. Or I quite like Karen. So I just really like. Oh, yeah. I I thought you were saying as in like the name Karen then, and but it's it's not Charon for anyone that it's like it is like Karen. Yes. Well, that's the that's thing about like a lot of those pronunciations. How it's pronounced. Yeah. I remember there was a uh, top tens video where I say like um, it was about Julius Caesar gets mentioned, and I pronounced it Julius Kaiser, which is the mm. correct pronunciation. And every other comment is why is he pronouncing it weird. Oh, it's like, I, didn't, I didn't know it was Kaiser. Yeah, it is. But, but that's the thing. But when you say that, people say, no, it's not. But it's so ingrained in pop culture that he's called Caesar that no one will ever believe you that that's well, then the a problem mispronunciation. Is, if you say Caesar, weirdos who know it's pronounced, that will correct you. So you can't win. There's no winning well, when it comes to this stuff. Of course it was Caesar, because he was named after the salad. He was indeed, yes. Yeah. I'm also a big fan of Dusa as well. When I realised that she's a maid called Dusa. Medusa, Medusa. I'm like, fuck, how did that oh, take me? Like, oh, for that, fuck's sake. Did you just get that? I, I didn't realise that. Yeah, that yeah. took me like a year to get when I realised, like, which is a maid called du- Ma- Medusa, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and, um, like, Megira and her oh. sisters, is it? The Furies, like those, yeah. th- those Furies, like, they've all got really cool um, designs as well. I did like them. Like, all phenomenal. I, I, that's the, I don't think it was a bad design. The only design I'm not really the biggest fan of is uh, some of the enemies, because some of the enemies are a bit hard to see on the Switch. Mm, yeah, playing on the Switch screen, it can be a bit not the best at times, because, you know, especially, like, the original Switch, like, the screen's a bit small and a little bit dull, so it can be a bit of a test if, like, you're on the train and it's really bright. Mm-hmm. Outside and stuff like, but was, yeah, yeah, was I've a, experienced that. There's a bunch of like enemies and stuff that are like a bit difficult to see, but to, I, I don't think there's a single bad design. There's just ones that I prefer. Like I two. love the design of Hades himself. Yep, the fact he's got the because he's Zeus's brother as well, so mm-hmm. they share thematic similarities. 
I'll like, say obviously... voice actor, I believe, as well. I believe it's the same voice actor for them both. Oh, right, okay. I'll double-check that, so Zeus's voice actor. Um, yeah. yeah, like, the idea that Hades isn't the god of the underworld, like you see in Hercules, the Disney film, where it's, he's got, like, the head full of hire, which I love the Disney Hades design, but the fact that he looks like the rest of the Pantheon because he is just one of the Pantheon. Yeah, also he's not the same voice actor, but I do believe it's uh, not. the guy who does the voice of Hades does a bunch of other characters in the game. And he's also the guy that usually narrates yes. the games, right? So I have it here, he does Hades, Poseidon, that's why I got confused, because Poseidon is mm. also his brother. Yes, of course, um, Achilles, yeah. Charon, Asterius, and the Storyteller. Um, yeah, because I, I believe that person is also like the narrator of like Bastion and yeah, stuff like Logan that. Logan Cunningham. That's the fact he does yeah, Achilles, yeah. Karen, Asterius, the storyteller, Hades, and Poseidon. That's like a he's got a hell- fantastic voice and good range. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like as well. I think Hades might be my favorite representation of hell in any bit of media because that's what it'd be. It's fucking paperwork. Like, what, yeah. <laughs> do you think of Hades like oh he's like he's down there like poking like the devil. The devil's mm-hmm. like he's poking you with like a fucking trident and laughing at you as you burn. It's like, no, it's all paperwork. Yeah. And that's all, all you ever see him do is just he's sat at his desk. He's like, this parchment work never ends. Yeah, and like that's the entire reason that Zagreus is trying to escape from hell, right? Is He just he cannot deal he, with the... Um, he can't deal with the tedium of being in hell. And that's the ultimate hell. And like the fact that it's like, oh, like Sisyphus has been carrying that rock for like a thousand years. Turns out like... He should have been let go like a thousand years ago. We just never got around to the paperwork. It's like, look how much fucking paperwork we've got. <laughs> and like, you see, when you're not fighting Hades as the boss fight, you just see Hades at his desk, just surrounded by stacks of papers. Like, oh man. And it's like, you'll talk to him as well of like, um, uh, oh yeah, like, dad, like, I think it's time to renew this case. And he goes, have you any idea how many millions of people need to speak to me right now? Take a number. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just, I'll get around to it eventually. I'll live forever, and you all will as well. And in that time, just you're stuck in hell. Yeah. And just for context for people who might be wondering, like, well, what how is long Hades? Might this, well, I was going to say, how long might Hades 2 be in early access? It does say here the uh, game was released for Nintendo Switch, Windows following an early access release in December 2018. Um, and then it was later released for PS4, PS5, Xbox One, and Series X in August 2021. Um, and like, I think it was early access for like two years on PC, and then it released in 2018. And it's just, it, the version we got was like the most polished version ever, but the early mm-hmm. release version was like, it was, it was some like minor issues, but for the most part, just the art style and direction made you forget any issues. And that's the thing. If you go and buy Hades 2 right now, it's probably going to be cheaper than the final game will end up being price-wise. They've said that the price may increase, which means that likely... It'll have to, right? Because it's like, It will. 25 quid is a steal for a game that they openly say is already got more content in than Hades 1, a game I play mm-hmm. for 500 hours. Yeah, and... It's going to be one of those of... It's probably not going to be in early access as long as Hades 1 was because they have all the learnings of Hades 1 behind them. But there's still placeholder art in there. There is still entire, like, areas planned for future. Yeah. So, like, the final boss is not in the game yet. Some of the areas, like, you know, layers of hell or whatever it is in the game, again, I've not tried to uh, to look into it too much, but, like... There is numerous, like, actual entire areas that they've not implemented into the game yet. Yeah. The game has still got work to be done, but as far as people are concerned, A, it's bigger than Hades already, and B, like, people are just saying, look, this is already feeling and playing better than Hades 1 was. Which is, like, the fact that that's what's tempting me, because everyone who plays, like, Mm -hmm. it's not just more of the same, it's more of the same... But more, more of the more. It's like, you can't do this to me. I've got a job. I've got to start yeah. work again this week. Like, why didn't they, <laughs> if they shadow dropped it last week when I had no internet and I could have just download it and played it for like four fucking days? Yep. Yeah. But, Carl, in terms of 
Hades, the game itself. Yep. Players control Zagreus, the son of Hades, as he attempts to escape from the underworld to reach Mount Olympus, at times aided by the gifts the other Olympians bestow upon him. The boons, yes. And one of the things it's worth noting about Hades is that I have yet to encounter a combination of things that the game itself did not anticipate. Mm -hmm. And almost every single combination of boons, choices, decisions, and paths through the game has a fully voice-acted consequence to it. To the point where, if you go all the way through the game and you delete every boon you have, there's a way you can Mm. get rid of boons, which is really difficult to do, and it's hard to get through the game without any boons, but Hades will have separate voice lines if you get to the end and fight him without boons. He has, vo- he has vo- which no one will ever hear, because why would you go through the game without boons? It's almost impossible uh, to avoid them. Apparently as well, Hades 2 has just amplified the level of lines cool. yep. in it. Of just There are bosses that like will come out with, you know, obviously you're, you're going through, it's a roguelike, you're going through the same runs of like bosses and stuff each time, and yep. there's, you know, branching paths, but ultimately like you'll often find yourself fighting the same enemies and bosses and stuff. And but the fact that every boss where, will like, have unique lines for every conceivable yeah. way you could encounter them and the equipment loads you would have for that fight. There'll be, like, shit where, you know, the boss might turn around and be like, oh, that that move normally hits you. Yep. Like, I'm impressed that you managed to dodge it that time. Yep. And it's like... like quite, like, the fact that it... It knows that, like, oh, every time you go against me, you keep dying, or you, this move always hits you, this move you always dodge, and it has voice acted lines to all these outcomes. Not so much about stuff that you probably miss, because there's like, there's lines where you talk to a person, there's also lines that happen in combat. For example, mm-hmm. do you know, like, when you've got to choose between two boons? It's like, oh, choose between a boon from Zeus, a boon from Athena. Mm hmm. Um, there is, like, a rare occurrence where you might have, like, the ultimate attack. So yeah. you get like access to like for Zeus, it's like you just call down like a giant lightning storm. And when you mm-hmm. get that to full, you get a special version of it where normally you'll get a line from the god in question. Mm. Every single one of the gods has a unique, super rare voice line because the odds of it happening are suit like almost nil. And if you choose the other person's boon, which causes that god to attack you, and then use their ultimate attack where they have to say something. <laughs> they all have unique voice lines of being annoyed that you've done it. Using like, their like yeah. ultimate attack against themselves. Well, yeah. They've promised to help you in that way. And I think Zeus will just say, like, I can't believe you've done this. Like, it's just <laughs> shit like that. But that, the fact that the game takes into that, that as rare an occurrence as that is, there is a special voice line for it. Just mm. in case it does happen. Yeah. Like, um, the odds of it happening are effectively nil. But it might happen, just... so there's a voice line for it. It really is one of the things that I think elevated Hades as a roguelike compared to a lot of others, where every time you go back to the chambers after you've died, and like you just rise back out of that little pool of blood, yep. and you go and speak to people, and like everybody has like new lines for you. Yep, and even after the game is done, there's still like another game's worth of unique voice lines for all of like, the post-game stuff. Yeah, and just the fact that, well, it's not just start a new run or get a, you know, pick a reward and move on. It's no, you want to go back and start speaking to other, like, people in the chambers and, like, giving them gifts and having conversations with them, developing relationships with them, finding out about the backstories. And it's just a really cool way of storytelling. Whereas, most other roguelike games haven't really implemented that. And it's just, and it's, again, everything you can possibly do is anticipated and has a voice that's a line for it. And the other nice part, if people are like, ugh, you can just walk past everyone and go straight into another room. Yep, which they'll comment like, on. You don't have to go and talk to anyone if you don't want to, which is sometimes you're like, I just oh, want to get back out oh, there. I can't believe I need to just get back in. And you just get back in and it takes 20 seconds. But if you want to spend 5, 10, 30 minutes talking to everyone and, you know, increasing your relationship with every single person there, you can also do it that way. That's as well as well. Do you have, like, a favourite, like, voice line, then? Because I love when you fight Hades. 
And I love that when you're first fighting him, because he's trying to stop you getting out of hell. Mm. And he's really mad about it. But after, like, you know, spoilers for a three-year-old game, where you, like, you earn his respect and you have that, like, you start to develop a father-son relationship, and it's more like he treats it as sparring. Mm-hmm. And if you beat him I, a few um... times in a row and you go back to talk to him, he's like, well fought. And it's like, that one <laughs> line is, is... It doesn't sound like a lot, but it's like... It's like you finally earn the begrudging respect of that hard-ass dad. Yeah. And I, I definitely don't have specific lines that I can point out anymore because it's been a couple of years since I've really touched Hades. Any moments then? Um, I don't know because for me, as much as I, I do like the characters and all of that jazz, like I think of moments in terms of like, oh, the gameplay side of it, like where I for the first time I like I think there's a combination of like um, Artemis with another god where like if you pick the right things you get like a lightning st- I think it's like a Zeus Artemis one where you get like a lightning storm that tracks people yep. and like follows them around and it's like it feels like you're almost unfucking killable I-, I remember like, one of the, we- the best combinations is um, Zeus and um, Poseidon where it's every mm. time you hit an enemy with Poseidon's knockback effect a lightning bolt flies off them mm. and you have it attached to like the gun which just hits like 40 times in a row it's like oh now I just cost 40 lightning bolts and those lightning right, bolts yeah. also cause like little bits to fly off them and it's just how how is like Hades going to stop this and then he fucking does yeah and there's so many times where, like, I've just cleaned everybody's clock and just gotten all the way to Hades without uh, any trouble. And then Hades is like, no, no, I'm, I'm about to stop you As well, right how, here, How right much now. did your jaw drop the first time you thought you beat Hades and he has a second phase? Like, of course he's the only boss with a second phase! The thing is, as well, I did it on, like, the magic pixel. Oh, you managed to get the down. first time I ever killed Hades on his first phase... I was like, You've done oh it. My, I'm on like one HP, I need to get like one last hit. Sent out the cast, got that last hit, and was like, oh my god, I've done it. I've finally done it, thank god. And then Hades just stands back up and it's like, I'm not done with you yet. I've still not beaten his third phase. I've not managed to beat the third phase you can get when you do the Pact of Punishment and Cerberus turns up. Oh, okay. I, he has a I've, secret, I'm unaware of that. There's a yeah. secret super power with a Pact of Punishment where you make bosses stronger. Mm-hmm. If you put it all the way up and you make Hades stronger, he has a third phase where Cerberus turns up and it's oh, like, no. I have never beaten it. You can't fight Cerberus, man. He just calls Such him a like a big like, area effect attack. But I love the Pact of Punishment as well. But it's like, mm-hmm. instead of just fighting one of the Furies, you fight all three at once. And they'll comment on it. Oh, like, uh, okay. Megara gets mad about it. It's like, don't make me fight with my sisters. I don't like my sisters. And then if you turn it off, she'll thank you for doing it. <laughs> but if you turn it back on, she'll say, actually, I did kind of miss my sisters a little bit. Mm-hmm. Same like Theseus, where you give him the upgrade, he gets in a chariot with oh. mini with mini guns on it. But then you could yeah, turn it, is, uh... but you could turn it off, and like Theseus, you know, cause Theseus just chats a load of shit. He's like, mm-hmm. well, I don't know why I don't have my chariot anymore, but I don't need it. And Zagus like, I gave you it, I gave you it for a challenge. He's like, I don't believe that black heart. Stand guard. It's like fuck's sake, <laughs> Theseus. Yeah, that's a level I didn't take the difficulty to. I always uh, just enjoyed playing at like a, a closer to base game experience for myself. The Pact of Punishment is really fun though, because that's how you get all the really good upgrades. Mm-hmm. It's like where all like, the best upgrades are locked behind that super hard mode, and they're really fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the thing is, I didn't get as deep into Hades as you did. Like, I maybe played like 100, 200 hours, something like that, which is nothing to sniff at, mm-hmm. but I'm very aware that. In the Hades community, that is nothing. Yeah, keep in mind, this is like, this was the game that scratched my Monster Hunter itch before Monster Hunter Rise came out. And I play a lot of Monster Hunter. Mm. Like, what, it's, what a fucking game, though. Yeah, what a phenomenal game. And I just want to uh, quickly dive into the development of the game as well. Yeah. Um. So, following the release of their previous game, Pyre, Supergiant Games was interested in developing a game that would help open up their development process to players. So they end up making the best game they possibly could from player feedback, which I, I'd say mission accomplished on that front. Absolutely. When yeah. it comes to Hades. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, they recognized that this would not only help with the gameplay approach, but also with the narrative elements, and thus opted to use the early access approach in developing Hades once they had established the foundations of the game. And, oh god, a Supergiant was still a small team of around, in tw around 20 employees. They knew they could only support early access across one platform, with the intent to then port onto other platforms near the completion of the game. Yeah. The fact that 20 employees began making this game is wild. It's, it's probably why as well, like, some of the voice actors voice, like, five characters. Yes, yeah, because it is a small indie team. And... Just, yeah, I, I, I'm i sure by the end of development it was above 20 people, but you you look at all of these like Ubisoft games where like thousands of people come to, together to develop it. I mean, just look at this, it's like, holy fuck, this game looks so good. It's like, how is just this game better than anything that Ubisoft has put out in the past like 10 years? Yeah. It's more as well just like art style and direction trumps almost everything because, mm -hmm. okay... Most of these characters, the only time you see them is like just that portrait, and then maybe an yeah. alternate portrait bit of art for when they're like, you know, they're scoffing or annoyed or something. Angry that, or something like that, yeah. yeah. That coupled with, like that phenomenal artwork coupled with some absolute literal god tier voice acting is all you need. Right, An when, excellent writing. With right? really good writing, yeah. Mm hmm. And then just the fact that the writing is so exhaustive. Almost everything you can think of is accounted for and predicted. Yeah. And um, like Every stupid does... thing you can think of doing. Even when you're going to do something stupid, like you just wander around like the hall for a while, Hades gets mad and tells you to leave. <laughs> and, like, it does means... talk here. Yeah, as well, you probably don't, you're not in Count of the Onion yet, have you? Oh no. So one of the uh, things you can maybe do I is... Haven't. Yeah, one of the challenges you can set yourself. Do you know you can like go into the ground and meet like chaos or something like that? When you start getting the Pact of Punishment high, you get to enter Erebus, I think it is. And that's like this secret other realm where it's just a combat challenge where you're not allowed to be hit. And oh, these are okay. personally set within the context of the game by Hades himself. And if you get hit, he laughs and gives you an onion. Uh, and, you put it, okay. and the onion restores one HP. And it's just the idea your dad oh. trolling you by making you eat an onion. And he'll like, just one laugh. HP it's like, as well. but, that, but it only happens after you've beaten him once. So it's like mm. your dad's like, okay, if you're really that good, do it right getting hit hot stuff. And if you get hit, you so laugh. Fucking prove it. Yeah, prove that you're as, as hot shit as you think you are. And if yeah. you keep fucking up those and then you fight Hades, he's like, I'm surprised you made it to me. What do those onions taste like, boy? He's like, I'm going to kill you for making me eat those onions. <laughs> and they think of that. And it's so, it had so much charm. And every run has mm. something like that in it that just adds a little bit of characterization to everything you experience it. It's not just mechanically kind of flawless, it's also just a lot of fun. That is why I want to wait for like final release of the game because I want all of these little things that they develop over time. But Lucas is right I, there. He's twenty. Quid. I know. He's right I there. know. Lucas. All the characters look so good. I literally the other day was like, "Do I just buy it and stream it, and that can be my excuse for playing early access?" It's the only thing that's tempted me to get a Steam Deck. It's one of the only reasons why I'm tempted, other than just like. There's a bunch of like little cozy games that I want on my Switch that are exclusives to Steam. But... That's the funniest thing about the Steam Deck, where everyone's like, yeah, don't you want to play like fucking Uncharted on it? It's like, not really now, I've got a TV. Hades, though. I want to play all the cool indie games that are only on Steam. That's what I want to do on a Steam Deck. Yeah. It's like, no, I w yeah, as you say, I just, I want to play all those big bombastic games on the most powerful thing I can with the best TV I can. I don't want to play it on the go. But like, I want Hades on the go. So that's what I want. I'm on a mm -hmm. train. I don't sit there thinking I, w I could can't wait to play four hours of The Last of Us. It's like no, I'm just gonna like yeah. just, just play a bit of Hades. Exactly. Put yeah. my headphones in, groove along to that soundtrack, which is also not so like it's fucking phenomenal. Hmm. That soundtrack is again just like everything in this game, just one of the best things soundtrack wise I've listened to in a long time. Like so good, right. It, it that's one of the reasons I think why. It's in so many people's like top tier list of games. Is there's seemingly almost no area where the game doesn't do the thing really well. Yeah, like narrative, gameplay, art style, soundtrack, like just the general flow of like gameplay and the roguelike elements and stuff. The gameplay, everything is, yeah. has been so considered and polished. 
and that's why it won game of the year, which it one hundred percent deserved. A lot of people's game of the year, yeah, one hundred percent deserved. Mm-hmm. And uh, talking about the game's narrative, Carl. Yes. The Supergiant team had discussed what type of game they wanted to make next, and settled on a concept that would be easy to pick up and play, which could be played in a very in very short periods and had opportunities for expanding on after release, driving them towards a roguelike game, which generally best utilised the early access approach. Uh, the roguelike approach also fit well with their past gameplay design goals, where they aimed to continue to add in new tricks or tools for the player that would make them reconsider how they've been playing the game to that point. Well, that's what happens, yeah. It's like you'll get a boon and be like, okay, but I've completely changed my playstyle because the boon has mm-hmm. made it different. Like when you get, okay, my special now caused a giant lightning storm. I, I, the special's what I'm going to try and land. Mm-hmm. And like, then all just, of a sudden, yeah. like the, there was one time where like I got a really good dash and all of a sudden the game became entirely based around me just dashing everywhere. It's the fact as well, you have what, like five, six weapons, and those five, six weapons have four alternate forms, and those four alternate... So effectively we have like 16, 20 different ways to play base base play, then 10 different gods who have boons, and those boons mm-hmm. can impact every aspect of your play style, from your basic attack, your special attack, your dash, your special move, just overall passive buffs, mm-hmm. and they can combine in probably hundreds if not thousands of different ways creating like a near unique playthrough experience every single time yeah exactly and every time you unlock a new weapon you're like mm, i don't think i'm gonna like this as much as like the last weapon i really liked and then they're all great there's only a couple of weapons that i didn't like because they don't work in a way that i think they should i didn't like the chaos mm. shield where you throw it and it throws out five shields at once because maybe it does but visually those five shields don't seem to get the special effects that your boon would give them, or it doesn't mm. seem to proc as much as it should. I still remember when I got the bow and arrow, and I was like, "Oh, it's kind of sucks. oh man, this just doesn't feel as satisfying as like going in with the sword." And then all of a sudden, it's like, "Oh yeah, but use your special," and you get like the shotgun spread blast. I remember when I did that, and I got the shotgun spread blast, and I got Zeus, and it's like every single arrow individually causes a lightning bolt, and you do it at mm-hmm. point blank range. It's like, oh, yeah. I fire seven arrows in my special button, so that's seven lightning bolts at once. And then I got the perk for <laughs> every lightning bolt has a 50% chance to do another lightning bolt. No, oh, so right, yeah. And just like 14 lightning bolts. Just stacks and stacks and stacks if you get the right build, and it, that's what's so satisfying about it, it of like it, all of a sudden every every like run is different because like, oh, one run just becomes all about staying back and doing pinpoint like snipe shots. And then another one is just dashing in and using your special like you've got like nine arrows that all activate like multiple different effects and stuff yeah also as well that means that like it's real for challenge runs as well but i've done runs like okay i don't use this weapon much let's just go in and try and just what happens if i get the gun and equip athena's boons to it what kind Mm -hmm. of build will i get from that and it's and the fact that as well it doesn't ever limit the amount of damage that you do. It's it's that it scratches that borderlands itch of the number will go up, and as stupid as you think it'd be to combine these abilities, we're not going to limit you from doing that. We're not going to mm-hmm. like nerf or if you want to make the most broken ass one shot build possible, you can do that. Yeah, and that's where the number will I go up, about, and all um... of these things will stack. Yeah. I talked earlier about like Binding of Isaac, and that's the game that scratches that itch for me. Of like, the moment you think that the it's gone too insane, it hasn't. Like the game will let you fill up the entire screen with bullshit that lasts a minute long from one attack, and just slows down like the frames of the game. You can like see the PC on fire. What's, what, like, what's like but the, the game most... will still keep going? Do you recall like what's the most bullshit thing you managed to cobble together in a run? I mean, uh, it's one of those where like those things were, for example, uh, one good example is probably just like the bomb tiers, where you can get like, oh, you drop a bomb, and it sends out whatever tiers you've got at the moment, which is like. If people are unfamiliar, tears is like the thing that you shoot. Yeah, your blood stones, yeah. Yeah, like, so is your this... attack is your tears in the game. Um, but, like, it will shoot out your attack in, like, omnidirectional bomb explosion. But then 
that can have every single effect that your tiers have as modifiers, including like things like turning into more explosions and turning into like entire screen clearing attacks and laser beams and all this shit and homing attacks and burning damage and more explosive damage and it just gets to the point where you can like walk into a room place a bomb and then just literally watch like as i say maybe a couple of minutes worth of just shit firing off filling your entire screen the boss has been dead within like yep. you know the boss died two seconds in but the attack is gonna keep on going yeah. for like a good, a good like two minutes Remember the one for me is when I got the um, Athena. No, it's not Athena. Um, Artemis's boons on the arrow. So mm-hmm. Artemis's boons are critical damage. So they seem really weak at first because they most boons will say increase your attack damage by this much percent and then gives you a secondary effect. Artemis's is nearly entirely the second. It's like your damage is increased by ten percent. We have a chance to do critical damage, and critical damage mm-hmm. is I think just straight up twice as much damage on that attack. But then I realized with the bow and arrow, there's like the crit- there's the timing thing. If you like knock an arrow and let go at the exact right moment, the arrow does double damage. But then yeah, I got yeah. the Hephaestus like boom. That means if you hit an enemy with an arrow, it will bounce two other enemies up to three times, each time doing fifteen mm. percent more damage. Then I got the Artemis the um, Ares boom, which is after you've killed an enemy, your next attack does two hundred percent damage. Mm-hmm. So if you kill an enemy, your next attack does 200% damage. But then I got the one from Artemis, which is after you kill an enemy or you hit an enemy with critical damage, every enemy around it is 50% more likely to take critical damage. I just remember once I just like knocked an arrow. He went, do, 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 do. Killed like four enemies. And then like Zagreus was glowing with like, like powerful sex energy. Did another perfect <laughs> arrow. It bounced around everyone else and killed them all. And it just kept stacking and kept stacking because each time I'm getting a critical hit, but that critical hit now stacks with a 200% buff from Ares, which stacks with the lightning bolts that are also dropping on everything, which stacks with the... And it's like, I think I saw one, like, the damage was like 4,000 arrow, like, per arrow. I'm like, what the hell? And that's the thing is, you know, Hades is great at it, whereas with Binding of Isaac, it leaned entirely into combining every single item and going on crazy runs whereas in Hades you've got to remember this oh there's this time I got like these like six boons that work really well together whereas in Binding of Isaac it's like oh do you remember that time I got a hundred different items that all combined together to make like a yeah. billion damage yeah. like, it's the thing it's like you can only ever get so many boons in one run and that's another thing that's really challenging as well I've, I remember once I did a run where I got every single god to give me at least one boon mm-hmm. when you fight like um uh so you might notice when you fight Theseus, he will always have a boon from a god you've not got, you've not interacted yeah. with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Watch there, I think someone's knocking on my door. Is that... Okay. I thought someone was knocking on my door. That's the delivery of something for <laughs> the house. But yeah, oh, okay. But I remember I got like a boon from every god, and Theseus comments on it. Yeah. Because he's normally just like, he goes to the god that you've not teamed up with, because that's the idea of like he's also a hero who can also get boons. And he mm-hmm. comments on it of like, I see that you've been out, you've been, um, uh, you've been very busy. You've been quite the social butterfly, haven't you, Blackheart? <laughs> but, but nonetheless, I still think the gods are on my side. And I think he just teams up with like one of the random gods, the first god that you go with. Hmm, yeah. But that's what you see, like, what happens if I get a boon from every god? Well, Theseus does not have a boon. He's just pissed off yeah, instead. He comments on it, he's annoyed. He's annoyed that you've like somehow managed to talk all the gods into being your friend for that run. Mm-hmm. And uh, going back to talking about the narrative side here, yes. like uh, Pyre had been attempted, uh, Pyre had been an attempt to create a branching, open-ended narrative. Once the game was released, Supergiant recognized that most players would only play through the game once, and thus lose out on the branching narrative perspective. Because, yeah, if people are unfamiliar, it's kind of like almost as if it's like a narrative sports game, Pyre, and you can recruit people onto your team. And they can, like, you can, I won't spoil anything, but, like, you can essentially lose members of your team. And people were meant to basically play through the game multiple times, you know, lose different people along the way this time and discover a love for new characters and stuff. But they just kind of play through the game once and yeah. same. I did the same thing. Um, but 
with Hades established as a roguelike, the team felt that the branching narrative approach would be much more appropriate since the game genre calls for players to repeatedly play through the game. And that's exactly what one of its strengths is, is they lean into that fact and because they love building a narrative so much, it's like, yeah, every time you come back, you've got new ways to interact with characters. It's They've all got so new good, lines yeah. and stuff. And yeah, it's a... Uh, it's just every part of that game is like so thoroughly thought through. And as I said, it, it's just I normally I'd use the phrase money burning on screen, and it's not money, it's love, it's care. It's just made by yeah. people you can tell that they just really, really gave a shit. Mm-hmm. And that bleeds into every aspect of the game. It's like they just really fucking cared about polishing this to a mirror sheen. Yes, they did. And you know, it's one of those of that's again my struggles with I do want to play Hades too so much, but part of the reason I loved Hades one so so much was because everything was just so refined and so polished and so well thought through and so well balanced yep. and all this that like that all came together because of feedback from the early access period and the time they had to make that. That means Lucas, you could be part of that. You could be part of like shaping Hades well, I, 2. I don't want to shape Hades 2. I want to play the best version of Hades 2 to exist. Would you want to play it in a year's time or you could play it right now? I could, but I've got other I've got like five to ten games on the go There's already so at the many. moment, and I, Carl. And I know as well if I get Hades 2, that's it. Like yeah. gutted for Tekken. <laughs> Go, Go for Dragon's Dogma 2, which I dropped like a fucking a hot stone. Yeah, I um still haven't even played Baldur's Gate yet because they haven't added crossplay to that yet. Yeah, so I've still got an entire Baldur's Gate three co op run to play. Whenever they fucking decide to add crossplay, please, please do it. Uh and uh, yeah, I'm I'm just like I've got enough shit going on in my life and got enough games to play where you are tempted, though, I don't right? need to buy Hades too. It's not like I'm struggling for games to play at the moment, but I also do want to play Hades too. Yeah, I'm I'm excited. It's that that's the thing. Maybe next week I'll I'll do my wiki entry on Hades too. We'll see. And Carl will just be like, the housekeeping for this one is that I'm going to be streaming Hades. Oh, stream it. If I streamed it, that means I've got to pay attention to chat instead of just like playing the game. <laughs> you always say Fair. that, right? Mm-hmm. We say we don't want to stream games that we actually want to play because then we don't get to play them and people cannot help themselves but spoil the game. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's always a tough one, but yes. Um... I think it's probably a good place to end it there because we've been going for like two hours Hell at the yeah. moment. Yeah. In this time, Kendrick Lamar could have dropped five songs. Oh my god! It took him twenty minutes to drop one last time. That's what last time five songs. What's a break? Like, and another song. Can you imagine if we stop recording and like open up social media and it's like, oh, another one's like, dropped? Kendrick Lamar has crashed an airplane into Drake's house. I think it's very funny. Because I feel like. Lamar's like that wasn't a good enough response to like feel like a response is needed. It's like he's he's like you know I did I did stomp his head into the curb, but he was still breathing. Like, but, there was yeah. oxygen in the lungs. Like I didn't like I I killed him, but I've not pissed on the grave yet. Just it's like the the weak source that Drake replied with is like, is not even worth acknowledging. That's what I mean. It's like, that's well, maybe what, it will be. What Kendrick Mars thinking of like, not pissed on his grave. He's, he's dead and buried, and he's real deep. He's all the <laughs> way down there. We can piss on that grave. Mm-hmm. I, I wonder how many other just tracks he's already got ready, locked and loaded for when Drake actually album. has something to say. God. I can't wait to hear the, the heart part seven, where it's just like murdering Drake on camera. This is gonna start like a Saw movie, in it? Just Drake waking <laughs> up, is like, ha ah, ha. Remember when you dropped that diss track? In front It'll of be you. very interesting to see where that goes. It will indeed. But you know what? That's another, that's another story for another day. Can't wait for Carl's like update wiki in two weeks' time, where there's been eight more tracks dropped. <laughs> Just World War Three has begun. Yeah. Oh, but thank you everyone for listening. Hope everyone has a lovely day.